Okay, hi everybody, we're gonna get started. Uh, we've got a long meeting and uh, I don't wanna waste anybody's time. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Jeremy Schreiber. I'm the founding president of Grand Street Democrats. Uh, and uh, this meeting is sponsored by uh, several downtown clubs. We're just gonna get a quick hello from um, from the other sponsors. Uh, and I also wanna introduce my co-host today, Patrick Kennel from New Downtown Dems. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, we look forward to a uh, great discussion today. And um, you know, this is one of those offices that uh, it, it is really exciting this time around. Um, I think it might be um, a little underappreciated at the moment. And hopefully at the end of this discussion, everyone will have an appreciation for how important this race is. So. Um, thank you to all the downtown clubs who have uh, joined together to put this together uh, and I'll pass it off to Jeremy. Great, thanks. And uh, yeah, let's just see if we can get some uh, quick hellos from the other sponsors today. Um, uh, uh, Mar Fitzgerald and Cameron Krauss are the brand new co-presidents of Village Independent Democrats. Uh, is either one of you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, Mara, are you here as well? Um, I know if she's not on now, I know she'll be on shortly. But yeah, I'm Cameron Kraus. I'm uh, one of the co-presidents of the Village Independent Democrats. Uh, I've been a member there for about four or five years. Um, it, I'm very excited for this forum and to be working with a lot of the people in this room. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Richard Corman, president of Downtown Independent Democrats. Yes. Hi. Uh, first. Uh, I'm Richard Corman, as Jeremy said, the president of Downtown Independent Democrats. And first, thanks, Jeremy and Patrick, for organizing and pulling this uh, forum together. This is the first of three that our downtown clubs are going to be sponsoring. Uh, and as, as Patrick was just saying, you know, this the DA position could be somewhat uh, under, over, under overlooked and underappreciated especially in a time when there's so much change in the city. But I think our, uh, the racial protests this summer is, if nothing else, is a reminder of how much impact this, uh, this position can have on racial and criminal justice. So we're really fortunate, I think, to have a strong, as strong a field as we do of candidates. And I look forward to hearing from everybody. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I saw Mar Fitzgerald did join while you were talking. So Mar, do you wanna say a quick hi also from uh, the ID and congratulations on your new appointment election? Sure, thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Mar Fitzgerald. I am a West Village native. I am a mom, a daughter, wife of a veteran. Um, election enthusiast <laughs> and the niece of I.O. Harrington. Um, I sit on community board two, schools and education committee. I also co-chair their equity working committee, um, equity working group. Um, and at my time with the Manhattan BOE, I really got to learn the intricacies of our election process and I am still and have been for many years a coordinator at the West Beth Pole site, which is where I grew up. And um, I'm very, very happy and very honored and very excited to be co-president of VID um, along with Cameron and uh, continue this work that we all do of engaging our community to uplift democracy however we can. Thank you. Thanks, Mar. Well said. Uh, Chung Sito from uh, United Democratic Organization from UDO. Thanks, Jeremy. Can everyone hear me? I think I'm unmuted. Great. Um, thank you to all my fellow uh, club presidents and all the downtown district leaders in putting this forum together. It's really exciting to work together. Uh, as Jeremy said, and Patrick has said, this is an important position. Um, there's so many issues related to uh, both, you know, racial justice that we've all marched uh, throughout this year, and um, so many other um, extraordinary issues that we're facing with right now. And so 
I'm looking forward to hearing from all the candidates and hopefully joining everyone to participate in the other two forums that we're putting together. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I also wanted to see if Ray Klein is here from uh, Village Reform Democratic Club. I didn't see his name in the list. Ray, are you around? Okay, well, they're also uh, co-sponsors of today's event uh, and also CODA, uh, the Coalition for District Alternative. Uh, Tatiana or Jamie, are you there? Yeah, hi, thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much um, for having us. Uh, I'm Tati. I'm the co-president of CODA alongside Jamie, who's running a little bit late. But yeah, really excited to hear more from the candidates. And as everybody, just I'll echo everybody else, this is such an important race. So I'm very eager to hear from the candidates and for uh, CODA members and everyone's everyone who's on the call to hear from them as well. And thank you, Jeremy and Patrick, for facilitating. Great, thanks. Uh, Patrick, do you wanna run us through the uh, ground rules for today? Certainly, thanks. Um, again, welcome everybody. We have nine candidates running for the Democratic nomination for Manhattan District Attorney. Uh, today, each candidate will get 18 minutes and we'll have uh, a lot of ground to cover. So we're going to be holding to that um, strict timeline. Candidates will get four minutes to introduce themselves. They'll get two minutes each to answer every question uh, that comes their way, again, within that 18 minute allotment. If uh, you would like to ask a question, uh, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Hopefully by now everybody knows where to find that uh, and make sure that you are displaying your real name. Uh, if you're called on, uh, please, please be ready to unmute yourself as quickly as possible and to ask the question in 30 seconds or less. Again, I cannot stress with the number of participants we have and the importance of this role and the issues that we keep to a very strict timetable. So thank you for that. The Zoom chat is also open. Um, please keep this civil. Anyone being disruptive or disrupt, uh, disrespectful, I think um, obviously we would have to ask you to leave the meeting um, just as if you were sitting in a room together and this meeting is being recorded. With that, I'm gonna pass it back to Jeremy. We're gonna take our first candidate. Again, we have nine of them and the way this will work is Jeremy and I will um, alternate between those who are lined up. Jeremy. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we're two minutes ahead of schedule, but let's get started. Uh, our first candidate is uh, Dan Court. Dan, I see you there. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. And uh, as Patrick explained, uh, you'll get four minutes to introduce yourself and then we will move on to questions. Uh, everybody else, while Dan is speaking, if, if, you're already, if you already know that you've got a question ready to ask, please go ahead and click the raise hand um, and I'll call on you uh, once we're ready for that. Dan, go ahead, thanks. Thank you, Jeremy, thank you, Patrick, and thank you to all the downtown clubs uh, and, and for organizing th this important panel this Sunday afternoon, uh, to all who are celebrating, happy Hanukkah, and especially to my mother who's watching me on this forum as well, so uh, I hope I do well today. But uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Dan Court, and of course, I'm an assembly member running for district attorney. Uh, I grew up on 193rd Street and St. Nicholas Avenue in Washington Heights in a union family. My mother, a social worker, my father, a teacher, 41 years in the public school system. Uh, I moved to the east side when I was 17 only because of one of the most successful government programs that ever was, Mitchell Lama. I went to college upstate in Binghamton and came home and went to law school at St. John's. It took me 15 years to pay back my student loans, but I did. Um, in 1998, after I got out of law school, Almost immediately, I started doing pro bono legal work for the civil division of the Legal Aid Society on 106th Street in East Harlem, representing people who could not afford an attorney on the precipice of eviction. In 2003, the chief judge of this state awarded me as one of the city's top pro, pro bono attorneys for that work. In 2005, I thought it'd be a cool idea to run for the city council as an, as an extension of my work uh, in the community as a pro bono attorney. Uh, the Democratic Party told me it wasn't my turn, but I ran anyways. And they showed me I lost by 3,000 votes, but I didn't give up. Um, right after that loss uh, with eviction intervention services, I built a pro bono practice that represented hundreds of people throughout Manhattan who, again, were on the precipice of eviction. In 2011, I was elected to the state legislature representing the east side and midtown Manhattan. 
And my record in Albany over the nine and a half years I've served as one as a leader on criminal legal reform and criminal justice reform, achieving actual decarceration. Um, I've also practiced for three and a half years in Midtown Community Court, criminal court, representing poor people throughout Manhattan as a criminal defense attorney. But I've been seeing up close, individually, from the clients I've represented, the inequities of our system. But I also learned something else about these inequities. And that was all of all these great inequities and problems with our criminal legal system, Cy Vance didn't create those. But unfortunately, his sin is something in, in some ways equally worse. He had this great vessel, this incredible office of 1,511 employees, $169 million, $800 million forfeiture fund, and he frittered it, frittered it away. He failed to use this office to equalize the playing field to fight back against the inequities. And that's why I'm running for district attorney in Manhattan, not to do the small things, not to do the little things, not to be another prosecutor making minor reforms around the edge, but to truly break apart and rebuild this office into a vessel of change that makes a difference in the lives of Manhattanites. And I'll focus on three specific areas in how to do that. First, I'm the first candidate in this race, and I believe the one who's put forth the most detailed plan about a complete revamping of the sex crimes unit within the office. Uh, from top to bottom, uh, re-interviewing each and every employee of the sex crimes unit in the office. The names of many uh, of the perpetrators, Weinstein, Epstein are well known, um, but the names of the victims are less well known. That will be one of my top priorities. Secondly, eliminating and ending the use of surveillance-based technology. This office uses all sorts of technology to spy on Manhattanites, and not just any Manhattanites, not the kids and not the young people who live in my district on the east side of Manhattan, but the people who live on Avenue C and D in East Harlem and Washington Heights and Central Harlem where I grew up. Um, I've been speaking out about this for three years and working in the community to end this practice as DA I'll do. And lastly, the things I'm most synonymous with in Albany, nine years of an actual record of decarceration. And I will expand upon that and do more on sentencing reform, conviction integrity unit, the end of cash bail, which I wrote the bill five years ago before it was easy or popular. I will expand upon all these things to end generally all sorts of punishment of poverty that provide no public safety benefit to Manhattan um, and to bring back this once great office into what it could and must be for 1.6 million Manhattanites. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, great. Thank you, Dan. Um, let's get right to questions. Uh, Gil Horowitz, I saw your hand up first. Can you unmute yourself? If not, I'm going to move on right away. You can keep yes, your hand I'm, up. Yes, oh, I'm you're responding. There? Hello. Am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. you are. Okay, question is, um, as you may, as you doubtless know, um, although many attempts have been made to make um, marijuana, uh, recreational marijuana, not illegal in New York State, thus far they have not come to fruition. Arrests continue to be made especially of uh, poverty people, whereas people, let's say in my 25th Avenue neighborhood might be just given a chastise, uh, don't do that again, if anything. Um, if arrests are made, what is your position on how to handle this if it comes before your office? I will decline all prosecution of any marijuana-based offense. No exceptions, uh, no, no determinations. I'm the co-sponsor of legislation for more than a half a decade about legalizing marijuana. It's somewhat of an embarrassment that in this state, we still have not done that. But as a prosecutor, I will simply decline to prosecute any marijuana-based offense. But uh, I will also go past, I will go beyond that because I've seen this, uh, I've seen this personally <coughs> representing people on summonses on marijuana in Midtown Community Court. So to your point, uh, the question brings up a very good point. People are still being punished. Uh, they're being hauled into court, they're being held to answer. Maybe they get an ACD, which is just an adjournment, um, but no actual punishment. But they have to take a half day off of work uh, for nonsense just to respond to a marijuana summons. Um, I will end all of that. I will seek to try and elevate these summons to the point where I have jurisdiction over these cases and can dismiss it outright. That would be a significant policy difference to what Cy Vance does right now. He say he, he, his policy is simply to decline to prosecute. That's just a start. We have to go beyond that. We have to elevate these nonsensical summons on marijuana to the point where I will have jurisdiction on it and then dismiss it outright. Um, that would be a holistic 
solution to make sure uh, that the, the NYPD, it's not just that they're not arresting people, that they're not writing summonses either. I understand this both from my work in the legislature and representing actual people in Midtown Community Court who've received summonses uh, over the last three years for cannabis possession. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dennis Galt. Thank hey, you. Dennis. Hello, Assemblymember Court. How are you, Dennis? Very good. Nice to see you. Good to see you, my friend. Um, so my question is, what is your plan to help rebuild trust between law enforcement and our communities? Um, it's a very, thank you, Dennis, for the question. Um, it's really about trust between law enforcement and the community. And the way in which we do that, um, the question has been asked many different times at different forums for the DA. Um, it's not about really a balanced relationship with the NYPD. It's about accountability. Um, and we need to ensure a level of accountability. Uh, essentially, I am not going to fail to execute on the reforms I'm going to tell the voters I'm going to implement. And that's prosecuting officers who engage in excessive force, prosecuting officers who file false instruments in police reports. And I'm not going to fail to do that because of displeasure or distrust by the NYPD. Um, we need to find a balance. They need to be witnesses on cases and we'll work together. But not, that cannot come and will not come at the cause of accountability. Um, and that's what I promise as district attorney. After all, if I'm successful in this race, if 1.6 million Manhattanites make me their lawyer in their courtrooms, my obligation is to them, not to the ease, ease at which my working relationship with the NYPD exists. I respect the NYPD. It's a very difficult job, but I am not going to de decrease. I'm not going to dissipate. I am not going to shrink from the things I promised to do as district attorney if the PBA Twitter handle says nasty and mean things about me as they have in the past. Um, I think that's a distinction and a difference in this race, Dennis. Um, I've taken these positions, I've fought for these views, and I stood before actual voters and defended them in a district with few if impacted families in an adverse way with the criminal justice system. Um, I think that is a distinction in this race that when I talk about reform, when I say how I'm gonna demand accountability, that the voters should have some trust that I will actually do so, having seen my, my record for 10 years fighting on these issues in Albany and in the courtroom and not shrinking or nuancing or balancing those views when I ask my constituents for another two years as their representative. Thanks. Uh, next hand up is Bill Ferns. Bill, good to see you. Uh, Jeremy, my question sort of overlaps with the previous one. So maybe the other people have questions go first and if there's time, I'll go later. All right, that sounds fine. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Alberto, you were next. Can you unmute yourself, Alberto? In the bottom left corner of your screen. There it goes. There you Can go. you hear me? Yep. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I have two short questions. Uh, do you think it's important to have a symbiotic relationship with the Latino, Black, and Brown communities? If so, do you have a plan to accomplish this? Yes. Uh, Alberto, it's good to see you. Um, Thank you. And uh, it's good to see you. <clears throat> I'm proud to have the support of every state and city uh, elected official in East Harlem. Uh, my colleague, Robert Rodriguez, Council Member Diana Ayala, and State Senator Jose Serrano, Jr. Um, and I think the, the, the two most significant issues, I've, one, I point to something in my past history. Seven years I worked in Albany over two vetoes by this governor to decriminalize something called gravity knives. Uh, some people on this call might know what it is, but just to give you an example, People would walk into a hardware store, walk out, get stopped, frisked, arrested, and prosecuted for something they purchased in that hardware store. The reason why this was significant is that 100%, 100% of those prosecuted for, for Cy Vance for this crime in East Harlem were people of color. 55% um, of those prosecuted by Vance for gravity knives in and around the district of Union Square on 14th Street were, were people of color. I spent seven years in the legislature working with legal aid lawyers and criminal justice advocates to finally decriminalize this. And because of my work and the work of others, 3,800 people will never see the inside of a police precinct and never will be prosecuted. That directly impacted communities of color, especially the Latino community in East Harlem and Washington Heights where I grew up. That's just one example of things, not that I'm going to do as DA, but things that I have done that had a tangible benefit to communities of color in Manhattan. 
Very good. My second question is, thank you for, thank you for the answer. Uh, my second question is, how would you prosecute on potential cases that may have precedent, especially in the cases where the defendant is Latino, black or brown? How would you prosecute on potential cases that may have precedent? How did this guy get two questions? <laughs> That, um, I'll answer quickly, so Michael. So uh, um, I, I understand what you're asking. I, I think uh, I think the best the best way to accomplish to get rid of this racial racially disproportionate prosecution is to decline to prosecute a whole host of crimes. And I came out uh, three weeks ago with my list of specific charges I'll fail, uh, that I'll decline to prosecute. And let me give you one example. Um, Seventy six percent. This is driving with a suspended license, not DWI, not DUI. 76% of drivers in New York City are white, but 80% of people arrested for driving with a suspended license in 2018 were black or Latino. Um, so if you look at the words of the statute, there's nothing discriminatory about those words in the statute that we have to change, but something is happening out there with the NYPD and Cy Vance's office and other district attorney's office where the people who are being prosecuted, they're all people of color. So I'm not going to say I'm going to reform that process or make it better. I look at those numbers staring me at the face and I realize there's only one solution, simply decline to prosecute. If the city of New York in its infinite wisdom wants to garner somebody's wages because they don't, they, they didn't pay their suspended license, okay, so be it. But I am not going to elevate that to the criminal court. And that's why I came out with this list of charges that I will simply decline to prosecute. We've done work on this in Albany and I'm proud of my work on this in Albany, but it doesn't go far enough. The way we can ensure that racial animus that's baked into the law for some reason doesn't occur in the courtroom is simply to decline to prosecute. Driving with the suspended license is but one example of how I'll achieve that goal. Okay. For the record, uh, Great, I'm with Coda. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Alberto, it. can we move on? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, Theo Chino, I saw your hand up next. You want to go ahead? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, hi Dan, and uh, this question goes a little bit for everybody. Uh, it's regarding the, the lack of oversight over the housing stock and the criminal behavior that has happened by non-profit uh, landowner who were supposed to have land uh, housing stock for the community and basically have used the tax credit, the 421A, the every tax scheme that existed to enrich themselves and not provide the service. Will you prosecute and hold accountable every HPD, NYCHA, and DSS employee within the city of New York, such as the Vivian who got arrested over placard abuse last week, uh, no, last month, will you do something? That's for all the candidates, by the way, thank you. Uh, Dan, you need to unmute yourself again. Sorry, Jeremy. Uh, yes, uh, uh, of course, I'll prosecute individuals engaged in, engage in activities that uh, take tax credits and they steal and don't provide the services. Similarly, I have legislation in Albany regarding placard abuse and placard corruption. And even beyond that, and Theo, I'll just take the question in a broader sense. Um, there, there's been a, there's a significant change that I'll implement in the way in which the district attorney's office deals with white collar crime, whether that's money, money laundering, a B felony, or other sort of criminal conduct. Essentially, Cy Vance has sought to monetize prosecutions in the white collar industry to enrich and expand his forfeiture fund pot. We've spoken about this in the past, and I have legislation that deals with this very issue. But as district attorney, um, I'm not looking to just expand money into the office. There are a lot of other offices people can run for uh, that are about giving away and securing money. Um, but the district attorney's office has to be different and it will be different if I'm the DA. It has to be about holding people accountable. It has to be about the search for justice. So in the terms of white collar crime, I will be about accountability. And if at the end of the day, after a criminal conviction that there's money that's brought into the, the forfeiture fund pot, that's great, but that'll be an appendage to what the real goal, and that's about accountability and white collar crime. Whether it's in the housing sphere, as your question suggests, or money laundering, or banks, or any other corporate institution. Thanks. Uh, Chung Sito, do you have a question here? 
Yes. Hey, Dan. Um, I'm just I, I'm going to ask this of all the candidates because I think everyone knows, and as you said, most of the arrests um, made uh, have been for people of color, particularly in the black and brown communities. And yet often the Manhattan DA's office are filled uh, with majority white, majority male, uh, bureau chiefs and senior staff. And so I'm asking if you would uh, pledge to make your office inclusive um, because that's the only way that we will have people with lived experiences um, who works with the DA's office, so. Thank you, Chung, for the question, and it's an important one. Um, I will certainly pledge to do that, but I'm going to go beyond just a pledge, and I've talked about this before. I'm going to actually put processes in place within the office about recruitment, retention, and changes in personnel that will ensure greater diversity, um, because it's not enough just for the DA to say it. There's 1,511 employees right now in the Manhattan DA's office, um, and it's a little bit of arrogance by candidates to suggest just because the DA says we're going to have a more diverse office, there will be. No, I'll go beyond that with a different sense of recruitment. Um, right now, uh, Vance recruits from across the country. Um, I'm going to change that. I'm going to look from New York City kids, uh, New York City young people um, wh wh who grew up in the city uh, to try and get them to be Manhattan DAs from assistant district attorneys. Doesn't essentially have to be somebody on law review, but give me that young person who's go, working during the day, going to law school at night, and maybe they're not in, on law review, but they're top 20% of the class. I want that person to be in the Manhattan DA's office. I think I can achieve diversity and excellence in that regard. Secondly, um, retention is a significant problem. People do their three years and then leave, in part because the salary is not competitive against wh white collar firms throughout Manhattan. Um, I'm gonna change that. On the federal level, there's, a for, there, there's the ability for loan forgiveness, but unfortunately 90% of applications are rejected. So I would use some percentage of forfeiture fund money uh, to reduce loan requirements if that assistant district attorney gives me year four, five, six, and seven. And that way we can recruit differently, we'll have greater diversity, and then I'll create that pipeline to those young people to be bureau chiefs and assistant bureau chiefs. And lastly, when progressive district attorneys come into new offices, I'll give you one example, like Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, 28% of the office turned over. Uh, in, by, com by comparison to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, that'd be about 156 lawyers. I'm not saying specifically 156 new lawyers are coming in. What I'm saying is just changes in the leadership team are not enough. The changes of on district attorney will be broader. There'll be more vast. There'll be bureau chiefs and assistant bureau chiefs. Uh, I, I will have significant change in the office, and I think that's necessary. Uh, and and uh, so those are the three ways that I will seek to accomplish greater diversity within the office, because as I said at the beginning, it's not enough just for the district attorney to say, I am different or will be different. It doesn't mean much if you don't put the processes in place within the office that actually effectuate that desire. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. That's actually the end of our, uh, of our time with you, but thanks for joining us. Thanks for all of those good questions. Uh, for those of you I didn't get to, if you still have questions for our next candidates, please just leave your hands up and uh, and we'll get to you. Hey, a lot of you. crap. Uh, Patrick, do you want to move on to our next uh, candidate, please? Thank you all. Sure, keeping pace here. Uh, Janos, I know I told you you'd be up in two minutes, but that's actually more like one. So here we go. Uh, Janos Martin, uh, are you with us? If you can unmute and put your video on. All right. Well, hello, everyone. It is such there a pleasure. Are. Can you hear me? Great. It is such a pleasure to be with all of you um, in the presence of so many clubs that have fought for progressive change at the city and state level and won a lot of those fights that you've led. And we are on the precipice of that moment in the fight for criminal justice and racial justice. And so that's why this conversation is so important and that's why this race is so important. My name is Janos Martin and I'm a civil rights lawyer running for Manhattan District Attorney because I don't believe that jail and prison is the answer to solving society's problems. I believe in a vision of justice that invests in people, invests in communities, and finds better ways to accountability that don't involve locking people in cages. So I spent some of my favorite years in the Lower East Side and a special shout out to my old friends from CODA who are here, but I've spent most of my life on the West Side. I grew up on 100th Street and with my mother and two brothers in a rent controlled apartment. My parents were immigrants and I had a pretty great childhood and access to a good education. But one thing is that I was a young person of color growing up in Rudy Giuliani's New York. And that meant being stopped and frisked harassed, 
having instance like one time I swiped my Metro card, student Metro card at the subway. I was grabbed by two men, thrown against the wall and asked where I'd stolen the student Metro card from. They dumped the contents of my bag onto the ground looking for illegal things, having not found anything, handed me back my Metro card without so much as an apology. Another time I was unjustly arrested and spent the night in the tombs. 30 other men, mostly black and brown, scared and not sure what would happen next. And while I'm fortunate that ultimately uh, there are no collateral consequences for me that uh, ruined my life, but for a lot of people who wind up, the thousands of people who wind up in our jail system every year, jail can mean the loss of a job, housing, the ability to raise your child, and many other consequences. That's why I'm running for office, so that we can have a different version for justice that doesn't involve jail. My experiences turned me into an activist. I was an organizer around the country before law school. I practiced civil rights law with Norman Siegel, investigated public corruption for the Moreland Commission, and did the work I'm most proud of leading the campaign to close Rikers Island, where we organized directly impacted people around a vision for shuttering this moral stain on New York City, reducing the number of people in our jail and investing in our communities. And by the end of 2017, we'd won a commitment from all city leaders that Rikers must close. From there, I went to the ACLU, where I worked on closing prisons and passing criminal justice legislation and winning uh, civil rights cases around the United States, all in the furtherance of reducing the number of people in jail and prison. So those are the values I'm bringing to this race. You know, when I started this race around policies like cutting the jail population by 80%, ending the war on drugs, and limiting sentences to 20 years, those were considered pretty radical positions. Now they're increasingly seen as the gold standard in the race, with lots of other candidates adapting them which is great. We're gonna to continue to push the boundaries of the discourse in this race, whether the issue is restorative justice, wage theft, or any other issue like political corruption. Uh, you know, I'm in this race because I think that there are a lot of people who have the right rhetoric around criminal justice, but don't have the track record and don't really have the conviction to do it. When you look at the policies we've released, which are more than any other candidate in the race, you will see the level of thoroughness and commitment we have to building a different future. I've spent my career standing up for people and standing up to power. And that is the kind of energy that I'm gonna bring to the Manhattan DA's office. So thanks for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Janos, right on time. Uh, let's start our questions. Bill Ferns, uh, I know you were eager to ask a question on the last round. Do you have one for uh, Janos? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, basically, uh, my, it's sort of twofold, but he can answer one. One is that uh, will uh, he commit to not taking any campaign donations from any police unions or their offices? And uh, uh, secondly, what is uh, your position on independently investigating and prosecuting police when they kill unarmed citizens? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bill. Uh, first of all, we, I've spent my whole career talking about campaign finance reform as a critical issue. That's how I wound up on the Moreland Commission. In this race, we're not taking money from law enforcement unions. We're not taking money from criminal defense attorneys who practice regularly before the DA's office to avoid the appearance of conflict there. And we're not taking real estate money, unlike some of my competitors. I think that the real estate industry is a toxic effect on our city politics, and we did not accept real estate money. Um, so that's the campaign finance question. Uh, with respect to prosecuting police officers, um, we, I've spent my career taking on the NYPD as a young civil rights lawyer. We sued the NYPD and won over Operation Lucky Bag, which was an illegal entrapment scheme. Um, as uh, I was policy counsel to the CCRB under Richard Emery during, after the, in the aftermath of Eric Garner's murder. And we investigated hundreds of police officers for misconduct. So this is something that uh, I've gone toe to toe with the NYPD for a long time. We came out with a policy on police accountability this summer around building an independent unit that will not have investigators tied to the NYPD so that we're able to independently investigate them and hold them accountable for things like excessive force, lying on the stand, domestic violence. Um, around police killings, obviously there's a current practice with the attorney general being assigned cases like that, but for police accountability in general, you're not gonna find a better plan than ours. Thank you. Great, Michael Zullo, I know you were trying to work yourself in with a question in the last round as well. Um, are you prepared to ask a question? Okay, I'm gonna move along. Uh, there was a question in the chat, let me find it. Uh, the question was, what would your policy be regarding charging children in adult court? And when would you use your authority to file charges in adult court? And when would you pursue a case in juvenile court? Uh, I would I would never pursue uh, adult charges against somebody under the age of 18. Um, part of 
what I, I talked in the beginning about what made me an activist and sort of turned on to how unjust our system is. But the full the fullness of that reality didn't sink in for me until law school when I started a program at Rikers Island for incarcerated 16 and 17 year olds. You know, at the time there were about 600 uh, 16 and 17 year olds on Rikers Island at a given time living 50 to a room below ground level. And it was just appalling. And I got to work with these kids every Sunday for three years and uh, saw the amount of warmth and brilliance that we lock up uh, in our system because kids make uh, terrible errors of judgment, uh, often driven by trauma that a lot of the people on this Zoom will never have to experience. And so I firmly believe in uh, investing in young people. And yes, young people need to be held accountable when they harm others, but there are so many better ways to do that than jail and prison. And I would, I know that the, the juvenile court system uh, will lead to less severe outcomes than the adult system, even for serious crimes. And so I would never prosecute any 16 mm -hmm. or 17 year old or let alone someone younger uh, as an adult uh, for a crime. Okay, um, Paul Newell, district leader, you had your hand up. <laughs> thank you, Patrick. Uh, and thank you, Giannis, for being here. Um, so. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, you know, there's been a lot of focus on in this conversation and these conversations about folks who are over prosecuted in our current system and by our current DA and more broadly. Um, but there's other sources of injustice, uh, including economic injustice. And Manhattan is perhaps unique from other DA's office in that it would have jurisdiction over some 80 percent of financial transactions in the United States. And I wonder if. Uh, if and how some of those resources that could be freed up by not busting kids for marijuana and so forth uh, could be applied to uh, prosecuting, investigating and prosecuting financial services crimes. Absolutely. That, that is, that's a great question, Paul. Uh, you're absolutely right that we are going to downsize the number of ADAs that we're going to need prosecuting what fills up our court system day low level crimes, and that will free up resources to uh, assign ADAs to other types of crimes, whether it's uh, protecting tenants from landlords who violate the law, investigating environmental crimes, or going after Wall Street. You know, there's a major economic crimes bureau currently at the DA's office. I've committed to strengthening it. And I have a few ideas about how we might actually more effectively go after Wall Street. The main one being incentivizing whistleblowers. Um, you know, uh, Wall Street crimes, white collar crime is very complicated and it's hard for as much resources as the Manhattan DA's office has, uh, these, these folks have much, many more resources on the defense side and the, in the corporate law sector. So you need to have whistleblowers who can come forward and explain what is really going on, what illegal activity is happening. And federal agencies that have monetarily incentivized whistleblowers have had much better results in prosecuting white collar crime. So that's one idea I have. Another is to change the way we do deferred prosecution agreements and make sure that the law firms that regulate uh, these bad actors after they get caught are not working hand in hand with the companies themselves, which is the current practice. Um, so that's how I'd go after Wall Street. I would also look at, in terms of taking on corporate crime more broadly, how we can use the Donnelly Act under the state law to do antitrust work from Manhattan DA's office. That's something that I've been consulted on by Lena Khan, who's one of the experts in antitrust in this field. I'm also being supported by Zephyr Teachout, who is one of the leaders on taking on uh, corporations and, and uh, breaking up trusts. In, in America today. And then lastly, with respect to corporate crime, there's more money stolen via wage theft than any other form of theft in this country and in this city. And I would go after employers who steal from workers and create pipelines uh, to workers on the ground to know which contractors, subcontractors, and major corporations are cheating and stealing from workers. Great, thank you. Uh, Carlton Burroughs, we're next. Yes. Okay. Um, I, have a, I have a question as it relates to um, the predatory lending scheme with HPD and the Comptroller's Office and how corrupt DOI is. Um, are you willing or will you address the corruption at HPD, the Comptroller's Office as it relates to the pension fund and the pension fund's participation in a predatory lending scheme that has all of these HDFCs suffering and people uh, on the verge of losing their homes. Uh, for instance, we're in court on an illegal foreclosure, but no one's listening to us. So we need a district attorney that's not afraid of HPD. And I heard you say that you're, you were a part of the Moreland Commission. 
I don't know how that got disbanded, but you need to start that all over again. And are you willing to really go after these corrupt agencies, the Comptroller's Office, DOI, and HPD? Because in the next few months, we might be homeless because of illegal activity by HPD, the Comptroller's Office, and DOI. Yeah. Carlton, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. And you're raising I don't know the details of every allegation you raised, but I'm certainly familiar with the general issue. Uh, my team has reached out to various uh, people who are part of uh, HPD's programs, and they've raised very alarming stories about uh, the way that uh, some finances in some of these buildings have been managed. And uh, I'm certainly uh, monitoring uh, how these developments are coming. I know people like Rick Echeverria are uh, leading the charge into, into these issues. And uh, yeah, I absolutely would be willing to take on HPD or any city state agency, any actor that is violating the law within our jurisdiction. And you brought up the Moreland Commission, why it got disbanded. I'll tell you how it got disbanded. You know, part of my role at the Moreland Commission was to investigate campaign accounts as special counsel. And I investigated Democrats, Republicans, special interests, big donors, and Andrew Cuomo. I led an investigation to Andrew Cuomo's campaign account that made him so angry he started uh, disrupting my investigation. And eventually that was part of why he shut down the whole Moreland Commission, something that I went on the record and spoke about back in 2014. So to answer, I guess the roundabout way of answering your question is I'm not afraid to go after Andrew Cuomo. So I'm certainly not afraid to go after HPD. Anybody, who violates, anybody who violates the law, I will take on because I'm unafraid. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, Carolyn Lasco, District Leader. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, Janos, can you talk a bit about what your prior experience is that will help you run a huge office like the DA's office? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. It is an underrated uh, facet of the job and it has not come up as much as it should in this race because ultimately you know, the district attorney is not going to be in there in court litigating cases, making decisions around uh, arraignment, right? They're running a large office and that requires management experience, a vision for the office uh, and experience in the political world fighting for these values. So First of all, when I was uh, at Just Leadership USA, I built a advocacy department from scratch over the course of three years. We were working in five states, managing personnel of different expertises across the country with a large budget. I then moved to the ACLU where I managed a 50 state decarceration effort. That was again, handling personnel from Arizona to New Hampshire, uh, sitting across the table from important political stakeholders like district attorney uh, association leaders, Senate majority leaders, staff or governors, trying to fight for legislative reform. Uh, I have lots of experience in hiring, firing, delegating, doing all the hard work that goes into running a large organization. And uh, frankly, it's, it's, it's rather worrisome that somebody would run for this position without that experience, like some of the other candidates in this race. Um, I think bringing, bringing on a strong team of people to manage the office with me uh, is something that I'm gonna take very seriously and something that I have experience doing both before my career, before I was a lawyer, where I managed large projects, as well as uh, my last two roles at the ACLU and Just Leadership. Great, we have two more uh, hands up at the moment, but I wanna ask a question that's come in um, from the chat. Uh, the question is how will you reduce gun violence in our city? Uh, I think we've all read recently um, about increases uh, statistically, it's up uh, the highest since I think uh, in 14 years. So Janos, how would you address that gun violence in our city? It is such a critical issue and one that I spend a lot of time talking to people on the ground about. Um, the reality is that gun violence is skyrocketing even as other crimes are largely flat. Uh, and that really speaks to a, a crisis of hopelessness, particularly in our young communities of color. If you can imagine how much stress most of us are going through right now, imagine being 18 with no economic opportunities, no safe schools to go to, no safe programming spaces to congregate living many people to an apartment. This is just a horrific time for all New Yorkers, particularly our most marginalized New Yorkers. And what we're seeing as a result of that is an escalation to gun violence more quickly than ever. Feuds that might have resulted in a fist fight are quickly escalating to guns. There have been more guns, per it's a supply problem and a demand problem. There have been more guns purchased in the United States than any year in our history. And those guns are flowing into New York City, cheaply available, leading to, leading to gun fights. And so how you get at that, you have to get at the core issue of why people are struggling. So we have to make sure we're investing in our most marginalized communities. That's why I fought reducing the NYPD budget, reducing corrections budget so that we can actually support the safety net 
We have to support violence interrupters on the street and programs like Guns Down, Life Up, which go into hospital trauma centers and try to de-escalate gun situations. And then as district attorney, I have to make clear that gun violence is gonna end. And I'm gonna do my part on the supply side, working with other government agencies in New York and around the country to reduce the flow of guns into New York City and hopefully one day pass actual uh, national gun reform legislation. We have time if we can work them in for two more questions. One is from John Bosco, another district leader. John? Hi there. Um, one of the things that has always inspired me about the Close Rikers campaign is that the folks that were leading it were folks who were directly impacted, formerly incarcerated folks. So Janos, can you share with us uh, maybe your relationship to organizers at Close Rikers from just leadership um, and how you have looped in folks who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated into your policy work? Thank you so much for the question, John. Uh, I believe that those closest to the problem are closest to the solution. That was a slogan that my former boss at Just Leadership USA, Glenn Martin, a formerly incarcerated man coined to really guide all of our work. And I think what made Close Rikers so potent is that people went from thinking about Rikers as this outside, out of sight, out of mind place filled with quote, dangerous criminals as actually listening to the stories of people who had been incarcerated there or had loved ones there, realizing this could be your neighbor, this could be your relative. This is somebody who can't afford to pay bail and is sitting in a jail cell even though they've legally not been proven guilty of anything. And that's what made the Close Rikers campaign so powerful is that it centered people who are directly impacted. We try to do the same thing in our campaign. You know, there are people who talk about hiring formerly incarcerated people. I've actually done that. Not, not only the last two jobs I've had at Just Leadership in the ACLU where I hired two dozen formerly incarcerated people across the country, but in this campaign where we've hired a formerly incarcerated person to organize with us uptown. And uh, so that is part of the values I live. We have nine policy papers that I brought up more than any other candidate. Every single one of them uh, took the feedback of people directly impacted by those policies, whether it was sentencing reform, intimate partner violence, wage theft, every single one of the policies we've come up with were done in consultation with people who were most impacted by these policies in the past and using their ideas, how we can fix them in the future. Great, last question, Joshua Waterman. Hi, Janos, thank you for being here. Um, as you're aware, the city announced recently a, a pilot program to, uh, to send mental health professionals instead of police officers on some mental health calls. Can you talk about uh, alternatives to policing that you would support uh, uh, in general and then specifically in uh, mental health calls? Absolutely, thank you. I think this is such an important issue and such an important time to talk about it. A time when everybody is struggling with mental health, now is the time to really lean in and fix what is a completely non-existent mental health care support network in our city. We recently released our policy plan, which you can read at, you can read all of these at yanos4da.com slash issues. Uh, in our mental health plan, we call for spending $50 million a year from the financial forfeiture fund on community-based mental health care. That means not mental health care that's done in conjunction with the courts, but rather through organizations like Fountain House, which is near me in Hell's Kitchen here, peer-led community-based programs where people can get the wraparound support that they need. That's, that's how we actually are gonna help people with mental health challenges. For cases that come before us in criminal court, we need to get people into mental health court instead of criminal court whenever possible. Right now, there are a lot of obstacles to the Cybans and his staff blocking people from getting into mental health court. Mental health court itself is under-resourced. So we need to use a combination of our money and the bully pulpit and our policies to make sure that people with mental health issues aren't getting the help that they need for the first time when they're sitting in a cage on Rikers Island, but rather we're intervening much earlier, keeping people out of the criminal court system when we can. And it, with res respect to your uh, uh, emergency response question, actually funding people who can respond with the speed of fire, ambulance, uh, and police when it comes to mental health, because that's the only way we're actually gonna replace police with mental health first responders is if we have the resources committed to get people on the scene as fast as any other emergency responder would. Thank you, uh, rapid fire round and we appreciate it. Back over to you, Jeremy. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Uh, we turn now to our third candidate for the afternoon, uh, Diana Florence. Uh, Diana, are you ready for us? I am, okay. thank you so much for having me. Great, hi, good to see you again. Uh, you get four minutes to introduce yourself and then we'll go over to questions. Okay, great, thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Diana Florence and I'm running for Manhattan DA to fight for the people who never thought they'd win. It's in my DNA. As the only sibling of David who is autistic and does not speak, 
I have used my voice my entire life to advocate for both of us. And it's what I continue to do as an ADA, where I held the powerful, accountable, and champion people without a voice. People like Carlos Moncayo, who was a 22-year-old carpenter when he was buried alive in a 14-foot unprotected trench in the middle of a multi-million dollar construction site right here in lower Manhattan. Because Carlos was undocumented and didn't speak the language, his death wasn't supposed to matter. But it mattered to me. I prosecuted the companies responsible for his death for manslaughter. It was my honor to get justice for Carlos and his family and all the Carloses in New York City, who now we clap for as a result of the pandemic, but who have always been there. Every essential worker putting their health and safety on the line. These are our nurses, delivery workers, and warehouse workers at Amazon who show up to work even when their employers deny them proper PPE or all their pay. I've spent my career championing these people and I've done this work, securing the largest wage theft conviction in the country, returning $6 million to 500 workers. I fought against landlords who cheat and harass people out of their homes and companies that rip off NYCHA tenants. That's why I'm proposing a housing bureau to target just these kinds of crimes, because make Moses, no mistake, these are crimes. I will fight for all of us in New York City who are tired of this DA's concierge system of justice, where if you have enough money, power, influence, and the right skin color, you get a pass. I was the chief of the first of its kind construction fraud task force, and there I created a new community-based model of prosecution, which brought together unions, community boards, and advocates, not only to discuss justice, but to decide together how to achieve it. I will use the criminal law to lift people up and not knock them down by over-prosecuting crimes of poverty. As DA, my priority will be prosecuting crimes of power. That means I will hold police officers responsible who abuse their position to kill an injured and prosecute not only the individuals who commit sexual assault, but the institutions as well who cover their tracks. Corporations that evade taxes and make money off the pandemic and big real estate and slumlords like Donald Trump. Imagine if the current DA had done his job eight years ago and prosecuted the Trump family. We might have been spared a Trump presidency and all the injustice it rained, not just on New York or the country, but the entire world. My vision for the Manhattan DA's office means that we don't have to choose between going after crimes of power and violent crime as if they are unconnected. When a kid picks up a gun, it doesn't happen out of nowhere. He has been deprived of the opportunity to dream of a future out of poverty because millions of dollars in taxes that should be funding our schools, our housing, our subways, and our health care have been stolen by CEOs and companies that incorporate fraud as a business model, knowing full well they will never be held accountable. I will change that because going after corruption really matters and who your DA is really matters. I know that the Manhattan DA can right these wrongs because I have done this work. And it's why I have the support from over a dozen labor unions, hundreds of thousands of essential workers, like construction workers and bus drivers and sanitation workers. They know that the DA's office can be a place of opportunity and not obstacle. And that together we can keep each other safe at home, safe at work and safe on the street. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, let's move right into questions. Uh, David Warren. Hi, good afternoon. This question is actually for everyone, but I'll ask you. Please explain your approach to handling cases in which there has been a serious injury or death involving a motor vehicle. What department in your office would you handle such cases? How would you assess whether a crime has been committed in crashes involving one, fatalities, critical injuries, and serious injuries as the item is defined in the penal law. And all the other candidates, if you could put that in your opening statement, answer that question, that'd be great also. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Warren. So it, New York, one of the reasons we all live in Manhattan because it is a walkable city. It is for pedestrians and cyclists and cars should not rain. And I fully believe that. My grandfather was hit by a car when he was 93 and ultimately succumbed to his in, in, injuries. So I understand full well that the DA's office needs to be taking an active role when cars uh, hurt pedestrians and cyclists. What that means to me is following a model similar to what I, I patented at the DA's office when I was the head of the construction fraud task force. What I did there was every single time a construction worker died on a construction site or was injured in any serious way, I was notified and I made sure myself or one of my staff members was dispatched and we made an assessment and we did an investigation. And when we brought, could bring cases and bring charges based on the current law, we did so. When the law had loopholes and we didn't think that we could, but we should, I, I took steps to write that legislation to close those loopholes. When it comes to traffic fatalities and serious injuries, we need to be doing that as well. We need to make sure that, that, that video is captured immediately and that police officers immediately call the DA's office. I believe that we should have a similar task force to the construction fraud with respect to traffic fatalities and injuries. That way we can be very nimble and make sure that we are responding. And again, if we don't cannot do it and we believe we should based on what happened and the facts and that the law is lacking and hasn't kept up with the times, then we need to be righting those wrongs and, and, and partnering with our legislative partners to make sure that the laws are fixed. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from uh, Lyric Thompson. I know you had a question in the chat, but do you want to go ahead and ask it here? Can you uh, unmute yourself there, Lyric? Sorry. Hello, how are you? Thank Great. you for taking my question. Um, my question is with regard to 421A and J51 fraud. I, I live in a 421A building that was never completed. It was the subject of a ProPublica article a couple years ago. Um, the entire application was forged and the building was signed off by corrupt DOB inspectors. Now, if that's not bad enough, nobody addressed the fraudulent activity. Nobody addressed the forgeries. Nobody addressed the fact that this guy just drop sold this building to some other guy who has no idea about any of this. And they've allowed him to continue in this criminal behavior. Now, what would you do to stop not only the developer, but housing preservation and development is very well aware of all of this. I sent them emails. I was in correspondence with Louise Carroll. So it's not as if they don't know. It seems though that they don't care. And there's an old saying, you give a mouse a cookie, they're gonna ask for a glass of milk. And the tenants have been put out like an all-you-can-eat buffet at Shoney's and it's hunger games. So what would you do to change that and address these issues? Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for the question. Let me start by saying real estate has been, and I don't use this word ironically, criminally under-enforced. And it's why I'm not taking real estate money, uh, real estate developer money, because I want to be sure that we have the same transparency about the work that I will do. I have a housing fraud platform that I'd love you to take a look at on my website, but specifically, let's talk about J51s and 421As. It is an area that has been incredibly opaque and overlooked by the district attorney's office. And that's because the information hasn't gotten there and the resources have not been devoted. I know that because I affirmatively tried to do cases in this exact area and I was shut down. So I will tell you, this is a priority of mine we need to use the, the power of the prosecutor to advance tenants. Tenants should not be in a position where they have to go out and hire their own lawyer in order to get relief. There has been a, a confidence, a, a, a feeling that there is going to be no accountability on behalf of real estate. And that's why these frauds have continued. And I'll continue to say that, you know, when it comes to this J51 and 421A fraud, it happens because there is also lax laws in terms of the way that HPD and other state agencies and city agencies patrol it. 
they don't make the developers actually file affirmative certifications. And that is a problem. So we need to be actually going after the forgeries. You're absolutely right. That is it failing that DOB didn't, didn't refer those for criminal prosecution. And we need to be going out to community members like yourself so we, we get that information. We don't rely on DOB or HPD. But the last thing I'll say is, you know, sometimes these cases are the beginning. Fraud cases that I have done, I've spent a lot of time prosecuting fraud, 20 years, and they never start as big. They always start with a small um, falsification, just like you talked about. The way to do this is get the information and follow the evidence to its logical conclusion. This is a top priority of mine. Thanks. Uh, I can see the next couple of questions are from folks who have asked already, but I think that's fine as long as I don't have new names up here. Uh, Bill, do you want to go ahead? I'm just going to repeat my questions that I asked before. Uh, one is, uh, will you take any uh, campaign funds from the police unions or the officers? And two, you mentioned holding the police accountable. Could you be more specific how you would manage that administratively? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I will absolutely not take any money from law enforcement unions for the same reason that I'm not taking money from real estate. These are two areas of powerful individuals who have had in utter confidence that they would not be held accountable. And I think the first way of just being utterly transparent is saying I'm not going to take any money uh, from either of these groups. In terms of police accountability, I'm so glad you asked that question. I do have a very detailed proposal on my website, but briefly to outline, we have to acknowledge that police officers in 2020 still have a confidence that they will not be prosecuted. And you know how we know that? This summer when there were protests, every single person in 2020 has a phone that can take a video and yet police officers you know, abuse their power right in front of people using their, their, their phones to videotape. So we need to make sure that we hold accountable these police officers by creating an independent unit uh, which means that the DAs that are in that unit don't have to rely on police officers for their cases. All they're going to be doing is corruption cases and, and excessive force cases. And they're not going to sit back and wait for the cases to come to them. Because let's be honest, no one trusts law enforcement. And people are not coming to the DA or NYPD to report instances of officers that abuse their authority. Where they go are community-based organizations and CCRB or the Civilian Complaint Review Board. So my proposal has us actually actively partnering with that unit. And I know that there is so much that goes on that does not make it to the DA's office at CCRB because my proposal was written uh, in consultation with a former CCRB investigator. And what he told me was often when they found criminality, uh, it never made it to the DA. And when it, when it did, they had to, it had to be filtered through the police department, which made no sense. So when we have a partnership with the NY, with the CCRB, we're going to get that information directly. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at it. We're going to make sure that it's criminal. If it is, we're going to do the case. If for some reason we can't do the case, we are going to be transparent about that. And I'm, we're going to put that on our website. We're going to say we've done this many referrals and this many have been criminal cases. This many we referred back for disciplinary and this many we think should have been and we're writing laws to, to close those loopholes. The last thing I'll, I'll just mention on this topic, I believe that Quickly, we have please. to be transparent about uh, disciplinary records. I will advocate for 50A uh, dot com, which will put on uh, once and for all a public database that anyone can search and see which police officers have bad issue of uh, disciplinary records, and we won't rely on them to make cases. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hey, James Yates, I don't think you've had a chance to ask yet, so why don't you go ahead, please? Hi, Diana. Hello. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to address something that uh, in your past that's very, very important to me. And that's disclosure, discovery, getting rid of the blindfold law, exculpatory evidence, and wrongful convictions. I wanna hear your side of the story because to me, I, I know that that was an issue in your past and I really would like to hear your side of the story because otherwise it's a big negative. I, I so thank you for giving me this opportunity to give my side of the story, as you say. 
Um, I want to be clear. The work that I did in the office was on behalf of tenants and in, in you know, immigrants and workers. And so I was not popular and I was an outsider. And so what that meant was when I was going after powerful actors in this in the, the case that we're referring to, and, and I just want to make sure everyone understands on the call, um, a mistake was made involving um, a disclosure in a major bribery case. It involved millions of dollars in bribes paid to a public employee by construction managers who were represented by connected attorneys to the current DA. And in the course of doing that case, and it had multiple uh, in parts of it, there was a federal angle, there was a state angle, I was the lead prosecutor. And suddenly my resources were taken away so that the paralegals that were in charge of all the documents suddenly weren't on the case. And I was left to do that myself. And I made a mistake and I owned it. As soon as I learned that there was a mistake in the disclosure, I immediately stepped up and took responsibility because mistakes are going to happen as much as I wish I were perfect, I am not. Um, but what it's really about is making sure that we learn from our mistakes and make sure that it never happens to someone else. This was a case that was really important. It, it, it affected the public trust in our government and the very fact that the DA's office in their own pettiness decided to take resources away was a problem. And we can't have that kind of leadership. We need someone who owns their mistakes, reflects upon them and makes sure that, that she can rectify them. And in, our case, and in this situation, what I plan to do, what I've learned is I wanna make sure that there is something to the equivalent of a Google Drive, which will make sure that every defense attorney can see every document that has been collected in a case. This one had millions of documents. And so one of them wasn't turned over and it should have been, but we will make sure that doesn't happen in future cases by, by using that read only Google Doc, uh, Google Drive uh, approach. Thanks. Uh, let's see if we can uh, squeeze two more questions in here. Uh, Tamika Map. Wow. Yes. Yes. Hi. How are you doing? Um, I'm all about rehab, making sure um, community and members can get back into the community safely. My question to you is, um, would you be willing to do a mentorship program for first-time offenders between the ages of eight, um, 16 to 25 years old? And if you are, how are you going to promote that to make sure it happens? Thank you so much for the question. Yes, you know, we have to make sure that we invest in our youth. And that means very much partnering with local community-based organizations. You know, I have spent a lot of time doing that type of work when I was a prosecutor, going out to worker centers and immigrant groups to partner with the people who are affected. When it comes to youth, there are so many amazing organizations here in New York uh, that can do that work. For example, up in Harlem, Street Corner Resources. Uh, Aisha Sekou, who runs that place, she knows everything about her community and she can tell us who exactly needs an extra push, an internship, um, a mentor. These are things that we must do as part of the DA's community outreach. I also have a plan for using the asset forfeiture funds to actually engage with kids who are most at risk. For example, kids that live in NYCHA, or are at ACS involved or in homeless shelters. What we can do is use funds to provide coding, but coding classes, but it's not simply about giving classes. It's also providing a runway for that kid to get out of his situation. And that means connecting kids with internships, not just in the DA's office, but across the, across the entire city. Every single agency, state, city and state agency has an IT department. And so we can actually you know, incentivize those kids to finish those classes and then connect them with internships in IT departments that will give them a way to get middle-class jobs. So that is an idea in terms of internships for all kids and ones that are justice impacted who are in, you know, in the criminal justice system. And, and, and I wanna be clear about something. I have no interest in, in using the criminal justice system to go after youth. I think very, very, very clearly, um, we need to be using the science and, and much, much of those cases need to be diverted to family court. That is what 
what raise the age is about. But in, in cases where we can partner with family court or where kids for whatever reason are in our system, we need to invest in them and make sure we break that cycle. We can welcome kids back into our community and that means investing in them. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, I'm sorry, I misread the clock. That's gonna be our last uh, question for Diana Florence. Thanks for joining us. Uh, for the three of you who have your hands up, if you wanna keep them up for the next candidate, please do. And uh, I'll turn this back over to Patrick for our next candidate. Thank thanks you so much, much, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Diana. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, next up, Alvin Bragg. Alvin, are you with us? I am, good afternoon. There you are. Uh, so Alvin, you have four minutes to introduce yourself, uh, to introduce yourself and then we have uh, two minutes uh, approximately for each question to answer. Have Great. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick, and uh, thank you, uh, Jeremy, for the invitation. When I was 15 years old, walking to the corner store, get groceries from my dad, police officer stopped me and put a gun inches from my face. That was the first of countless stops growing up in Harlem for militarized police force in the 1980s, three of them at gunpoint by the NYPD. I also had a gun pointed at me three times by people who were not the police. These early experiences are why I went to law school. I left Harlem, went to Harvard for college and law school and came back here and got right back to work, starting off as a civil rights lawyer and a criminal defense lawyer, becoming a federal prosecutor focused on public corruption and ultimately becoming the chief deputy attorney general of New York State, overseeing a staff of 1200. And along the way, I focused both on cases that truly make us safer and also on reforming our broken system from the inside. So that means prosecuting the owner of a $30 million business who was laundering millions of dollars of drug money for a violent international cartel. That case made us safer. But it also means leading the work the Attorney General did on stop and frisk, issuing a pioneering report showing that 0.1% of stops, only 0.1% resulted in a conviction for a gun offense, putting a lie to the NYPD's theory for that racist program. I've also used the power of government to stand up for those who've been marginalized, bringing pioneering cases, standing up to landlords who harass tenants out of their homes and standing up to employers who are cheating workers out of hard earned wages. We need a DA on day one who has this 360 degree experience. Let's talk about what's waiting for the new DA, the docket. We know there's a Trump investigation. I have investigated Trump and his children and held them accountable for their misconduct with the Trump Foundation. I also sued the Trump administration more than 100 times for DACA, the travel ban, separation of children from their families at the border. So I know that work. I know how to follow the facts and hold people in power accountable. We also know we need to reboot the sex crimes unit. That's the unit that failed to hold Harvey Weinstein accountable the first time when there was an audio recording. Uh, it's also the unit that failed to hold Jeffrey Epstein accountable. I sued Harvey Weinstein at the Attorney General's office. I've done this work involving heinous sex acts and I'm ready to lead in this area. As important as what I have done is what I have not. I have not done the cases that have been the drivers of mass incarceration. The only misdemeanor trial I've done has been prosecuting two men who blocked the Planned Parenthood facility downtown and didn't let staff and patients in. We also need a district attorney who can manage and change the culture from day one, a culture that doesn't ask, does this make us safer, but rather churns and processes and criminalizes race and poverty. I've run a 1.5 person unit. I've run a unit of 100 lawyers. I've stood up a new unit on police accountability in the AG's office, and I oversaw a staff of 1,200. Lastly, we need to talk about the moment we're in and the conversation we need to continue to have about our racial reckoning in this country and police accountability. I've worked, I've really lived this issue my entire life. I've worked in it the past 20 years. My first case was suing the state police for excessive force. I'm currently representing Eric Garner's family in a case against the city seeking transparency. Uh, I know this work inside out. I've prosecuted an FBI agent for lying. I've led this work for the state. Equally as important, I know it personally. I live it every single day. I'm still that kid who have a gun pointed at him years ago. Just the other day, I talked to my 11-year-old and my 15-year-old about these issues. Come June, this election will come and pass. I will still be having that question, that conversation. This is my life. This is my life's work. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. 
Uh, we're going to go right to questions. Uh, and what I want to do is um, ask for those who have not yet had a chance to ask a question to go first. So with that, Scott Kaplan, are you able to unmute yourself and go? Yes. So thank you. Thank you and thank you for a great format. Um, my question, Mr. Bragg, one, um, what do you say to families of, of uh, victims uh, seeking justice uh, with respect to uh, uh, pledges not to seek uh, incarceration for uh, more than 20 years in cases where um, teenagers are killed? And, and secondly, what, could you comment on uh, police stings against uh, in non-trafficking uh, cases involving prostitution? So the, the first question, and thank you, Scott, and I hope I, hope I understood it, is you know, I have not opined for any sort of you know, particular, I, each case is individualized. I've spent a lot of time working with survivors and survivors' families, um, and so, I have done that over the years. I would continue to do that. I've done that in some of the most heinous crimes. Uh, and I would look at them individually. Uh, and then I would talk to them about deterrence and the, the data that does show that really deterrence is driven by the, 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 the sort of certainty of a prosecution being brought as opposed to the length of the punishment. Uh, and would talk about that with them. I've had these conversations uh, with, with survivors of, of, of folks who've suffered that type of harm. On police things, you know, my my career has focused on crimes that truly address public safety. I always ask the question, does it make us safer? So there are a number of things, and your question suggested you're familiar with them, uh, you know, where the police are basically doing a gotcha, uh, doing a buy and bust on a low, low, low level dealer. And, and those those cases don't make us safer. The kind of case I talked about earlier, going after the head of a $30 million business. I know how to do those cases, how to build those cases. Those cases actually make us safer. And that's what I would focus on. That's the management change I'm talking about. Moving us away from uh, these low level offenses that, you know, someone's gonna be back, that person's gonna be back from Rikers in 30 days in the same spot. Doesn't do any good. We need to focus on what I've done throughout my career. Great, thank you. Uh, Val Jones, hey Val. Hi. Are you able to unmute? There you are, um, lady. Uh, my question is about heroin addiction. Um, there's a, I used to, I'm retired, a uh, re retired registered nurse, and I worked at one point with heroin addicts, and it just seemed like a real revolving door because the person may be homeless, they use heroin, they get arrested, they have a felony conviction, then it's difficult to get a job, they're back out on the street, and it's just, it is just an ongoing cycle. So how would you address uh, this issue? And lately I've been to some things, even in my community, where people have talked about the needles in the park. Um, so I don't know about exchange programs or whatever. Uh, and something somebody else said to me about in terms of harm reduction. I don't know what harm reduction programs are out there, you know, other than methadone maintenance, but how would you address heroin addiction? Because I think that that's a, a big problem now, and I don't think it's going anywhere. And I think those people just tend to be back and back and back in the system, homeless and unemployed. Right. Thank you for the question. And I, I've just started to sort of share and talk about this, but I would broaden it from heroin. My, my dad suffered from alcohol addiction. That, that, that is sort of, I've just started to talk about this uh, recently. So it's, it's challenging for me, but, but I saw him struggle. His, his addiction was alcohol. So I would expand it beyond uh, uh, heroin. And, and we see this system that churns people out and does not address the harm. So I, there are a couple of issues I would say. We have drug court, as you may know. It is being underutilized in my view. But one of the main challenges is anyone who knows anything about addiction, and I'm, I'm not a nurse, so I don't know the, the health side. I defer to people like you, but I've seen it as a, as a loved one. Managing it around a court docket, right? So this notion of we're gonna give you this program and then you know we'll give you one chance to miss a court date or a second chance and then you're, you're done. It, it doesn't work. We have to let really let people like you lead and follow the science and set up programs around that. Some of this we can divert on the front end so it's never in court, other more serious ones. 
the court schedule has to, and I think as DA, we can lead and push for this, uh, be around a, a, a reasonable, understandable one, one driven by the science and understanding this addiction is not an on off switch. I mean, my dad struggled for 30 plus years. Uh, so really it's putting people like you in charge. I'm gonna hire people in the DA's office like I did in the AG's office uh, who, who have the expertise to help us uh, be drivers uh, on this type of issue. Great, um, I wanna ask quickly questions from the chat, um, Alvin. If you could address one that was asked earlier and that was how do you as a candidate for DA uh, propose to curb gun violence in our city. Um, I, again, I think it was reported that, that we're at a 14 year high on gun violence. And so the question was asked broadly, what would you do as district attorney? Right, I will, I just, I, in honor of my dad, I wanna ask one, one more thing, cause I didn't mention, part of the question was about homeless and he ran homeless shelters too. So I wanna talk about the, the, the benefit that folks struggling with addiction still bring to our society. He did a great job on that. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of guns, this is a significant issue, you know, uh, it, this uptick, particularly where I am in Harlem now, we've seen an uptick. When I was at the Attorney General's office, I oversaw a group of folks far smarter than me, uh, data folks who came up with this great portal, which is being underutilized by law enforcement. It tracked and churned the data on all guns found at crime scenes and traced them back to lawful, uh, the last lawful sale from a federal licensed firearm dealer. And what it, what it showed was, was really illuminating. Uh, you know, some of these shops, none of which are located in Manhattan, by the way, or even in New York City, uh, many of them coming from North Carolina and down south, some of them upstate, show tremendous amount of guns from the same place, and many of them ending up at the crime scene in a short amount of time. We need to focus there. That's the kind of long-term investigation I've done. We, we need to look at the most culpable people, the people who start this flow of pain into our communities and profit from it. So that would be the, a centerpiece of my program. And like a lot of these other issues, this, this is personal to me. I talked about having a gun pointed at me. I've had an AK pointed at me as a child. I've been with my brother-in-law whose best friend was murdered in front of him and looked in his eyes. So we need to deal with not just what I just said in terms of a law enforcement approach, but the broader public health issue. Uh, you know, looking in his eyes or knowing some of the trauma I still feel from that, we need to address that as part of our, of our response as well. Great, thanks. I uh, want to get to a couple of people who haven't had a chance to ask questions. Uh, Tommy Loeb, are you able to unmute quickly? Okay, Tommy, we'll come back to you, I promise, but I'm going to move to, hang on, just really quickly. Uh, Jim I'm here. Surratt. Oh, so, sorry. No, you, um, beat the, you beat the buzzer. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, one of the things that Cy Vance did was he built up this enormous forfeiture fund by accepting financial fines from large corporations and people who had money instead of uh, uh, prison sentences. And the converse happens with police officers. We had an incident on the Lower East Side where an officer attacked somebody unnecessarily. He was put on desk duty, his gun taken away it took six months for him to eventually resign before he went to trial. And now he's not being prosecuted as far as we know. So one side, you pay a financial fine, you get off. The other side, if you're a police officer, you resign and you don't get prosecuted. So you, you, you capture our two systems of justice uh, so well. What I'll say is I've worked on both sides of them. So I have held accountable, uh, you know, folks like, you know, Trump himself, also, you know, prosecuting the head of a pharmacy who was uh, using uh, his pharmacy to uh, basically, you know, do a illicit prescription fraud. I, pr I prosecuted corporate executives for antitrust. I prosecuted employers for cheating workers out of wages. I prosecuted slum landlords. So I go where the facts take us and stand up for those uh, who've been marginalized. So that's, that's one. Two, on police accountability, I, you know, I'm the only person in this race who's prosecuted law enforcement. I took the trial, a case that everyone said wasn't going to, uh, we weren't going to prevail. I'm convicted an FBI agent who lied and obstructed justice. Um, you know, I've also uh, taken other cases to trial, an uh, NYPD officer, uh, and there was an acquittal there. So I, I know these cases. I am not afraid of doing a hard case where justice requires it. We need to go where the facts take us. And what we've seen a lot with this district attorney is sort of saying, ah, I'm worried about my win-loss rate. I'm not going to do the hard case. 
I've done those hard cases throughout, which means sometimes you don't get a conviction, right? But it is important to fight the good fight. Uh, and lastly, you mentioned the forfeiture funds. This goes back to a couple of earlier questions. This is a key tool at the DA's disposal. I would have a community uh, participation process on how that money would be used, but I would advocate to the community uh, that we should be using those monies to address some of the issues we talked about earlier. Um, uh, uh, mental health, which we didn't talk about, drug addiction. Uh, you know, the DA's office, unlike any other DA, really probably in the country, but certainly in the state, has this power uh, of the purse. And again, I would go through and, and, and defer to the community on how to use it, but I would respectfully submit that those are areas we could use it in. Alvin, thank you. And I want to see if we can work in two more questions in the next five minutes. Sorry for the lightning round, um, but first up would be Evie Gross. Avi? Can okay. you hear me? Can there you hear you me? Okay, beat the buzzer. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Bragg, Let's get this thank, buzzer. You, thank you so much for this and, and for this format. Um, I had a, a really shocking experience that just opened my eyes to something that Many New Yorkers are unfortunately aware of, and um, you know, I, I struggle with what I've learned, and that is simply the fact that if a law-abiding citizen reports serious corruption and presents all the hard evidence that anyone could ever need uh, to prosecute, and the, the agencies are given this evidence, and they see it, and they vet it, and they agree with it, but the problem is that the evidence pertains to people who are incredibly powerful, have unlimited resources and unlimited influence. And to my shock and horror, it turns out that powerful people are able to go walk into law enforcement agencies and say, hey, I'm a really powerful guy. So why don't you do me a favor and close that case? Now, I did not think this was possible. This sounds like something out of a movie, but I, I'm asking you, Mr. Greg, Breck, respectfully, do you agree that that is the reality we live in today? Because for, I, I believe based on my experience, yes, that is. Uh, I feel that that erodes public confidence in the deepest way. And New Yorkers are entitled to know that the district attorney's office goes after bad guys. Doesn't matter how many zeros they have in their account they are held accountable. And the idea that you could just bribe your way through the most audacious crimes, no matter what, is sickening to me. And it has really um, eroded my own confidence. So my question is twofold to you. First, do you agree with me that the situation is as bleak as I saw it, where money and power could literally buy you anything and get you a... a above the law of a free card? And second of all, if it is true, how are you going to change this fundamental issue where people cannot simply buy their way out of justice? Thank you. I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, and I think the first thing you do to change that is elect me. Uh, you know, Donald Trump, Harvey Weinstein, former majority leader Malcolm Smix, council member Daniel Halloran. These are people I prosecuted. I go where the facts take me. I'm not a politician. I'm a, a career public servant and I go where the facts take me. Uh, there's a question in the chat uh, asking whether some of the cases I talked about were civil or criminal. Um, so let, let me just say, the case against the FBI agent, criminal case, conviction. Uh, Malcolm Smith who tried to bribe his way onto the mayoral line, some of you may recall, criminal case, conviction. Uh, the thirty million dollar uh, money laundered by the the money laundered by the head of thirty million dollar business criminal case conviction. These are cases that either threatened our public safety or, or fundamentally eroded our our faith in government. Um, the cases I mentioned about uh, the the, uh, the slum landlord, which involved a mortgage fraud, criminal case, uh, wage and hour cases. We did some of those civilly, but we also did them criminally. I have spent the last twenty plus years using the law to fight for people who've been marginalized. And if I'm DA, I think you'll send a message to everyone in power, this guy's back again. Very quickly, if we can get it in, Jim Ferret, you've been waiting so patiently. All right, Jim, um, I hope you'll ask your question of future candidates and with that, thank you, Alvin. Uh, I'm gonna toss it back to Jeremy as we are keeping on schedule and are ready for the next candidate. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it greatly. Enjoy the rest of the day. You too.
Hey, thanks very much. Uh, and thanks everybody for sticking with us. We're entering the second half of our second hour, uh, if you can believe that. Um, this is, uh, as somebody else mentioned in the chat, a really spectacular set of candidates. Uh, so I really appreciate you sticking around and asking these questions. Our next candidate is Eliza Orlans. Uh, Eliza, are you there? You can. I am. Thank Great. you so much for having me. Good to see you. You've got uh, four minutes to introduce yourself and then we'll get to questions. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Eliza Orlands, and I'm the only public defender running for Manhattan District Attorney. 大家好, Today, I'll make the case for why being the only public defender in the race makes me the most qualified to serve as Manhattan District Attorney. But after the tragedy we all witnessed this week, the horrific execution of Brandon Bernard, I want to start with something different. The circumstances surrounding Brandon's death are emblematic of one of the great injustices of our system, which is the reality that people like my clients lose their jobs, homes, children, and more every day because of prosecutorial misconduct and incompetence. But the system that upheld the death sentence for Brandon holds prosecutors to a different standard. Prosecutors are allowed to destroy lives with impunity. They are free to look back and say they were wrong. They are afforded the privilege of admitting as the prosecutors whose misconduct resulted in Brandon's conviction and death sentence have done that they made a mistake all without ever being held accountable for their actions. Five of the candidates you're hearing from here today are former prosecutors with more than five decades of prosecutorial experience between them. Some of them are proud of that. Some think that experience makes them more qualified than a public defender like me to serve as Manhattan District Attorney. But I disagree. And I would implore all of you who are listening to think about what it really means to have prosecutorial experience in the United States, to have played such an active role in a system this unjust and cruel, to have held a position of power in an organization while it rampantly violated human rights and human dignity. What prosecutors do every day to the people like the ones I've represented over, over a decade of, as a public defender is cruel, inhumane, and plainly wrong. And like so many other things, it's taken our country too long to acknowledge that. Why should the arsonist be trusted with putting out the fire? Can we really trust someone to change a system in which they were complicit? Can we entrust this process that's so urgently needed and so long overdue to the people, prosecutors, who were the most directly responsible for the injustice? It's public defenders, not prosecutors, who have the experience we need. The demonstrated commitment to honestly acknowledging the problems and trying to fix them. I've spent my entire career going up against Cy Vance's office in court. I've represented thousands of people charged with crimes, as many as 180 clients at the same time. And for every human being I've represented, I've had to manage countless moving parts from making strategic decisions and interviewing witnesses to leading teams of investigators, social workers, experts, and all of that without ever losing sight of the unique stories, circumstances, and human beings at the heart of each case. When prosecutors make decisions that have devastating impacts on people's lives, they blame the system, say they're just doing their jobs. But it's public defenders who have to pick up the pieces, who advocate for restorative justice and rehabilitation and work every day to break the cycle and change the system. And that is precisely the experience we need because defeating Cy Vance is just the first step. After that, the real work begins. So the next Manhattan DA must be someone who will fight, who brings a real sense of urgency to the job, who understands what's at stake. Simply having a vision for changing the office, even if it's bold and progressive, isn't enough. The next DA must have the will and be prepared to lead and make changes from day one. And I'm talking about real transformative change and moving to the right side of history here. And this is so long overdue, we do not have time to waste. We have to remember when Cy Vance first ran, he made promises that sounded good to progressives at the time too, that he has not kept. So we need someone with the experience to understand the implications of the policies of, in the real world and someone with the authentic commitment to transforming the system who's ready to make bold systemic change. I am that person, I can do both, and I hope you will join me in the fight. I'd be honored to receive your endorsement and look forward to your questions. Great, thanks a lot, Eliza. Uh, let's uh, let's move on to questions. Uh, Tony Hoffman, I don't think you've had a chance to say anything yet. You want to go ahead? Uh, 
Uh, Eliza, how are you? I just want you to know that this question isn't aimed at you because you're the only public defender, but it, this is when they got to me. Uh, but the, 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 que the question is, uh, uh, most people in, in Manhattan or maybe in New York City believe in the closing of Rikers Island. Uh, but there's also a tremendous controversy about expanding the prison uh, in Chinatown. Uh, right now, it's a 40 floor, 40 floor proposal, but I, I'd like to hear how, how you feel about the juxtaposition of the two. Well, anyone who has ever stepped foot in Rikers Island knows that that place is an absolute hellhole and must close. It is, you know, I've had hundreds, probably maybe over a thousand, maybe more than that clients held at Rikers Island over my decade as a public defender. And I have seen the way in which it has deteriorated their mental health, um, their physical health, the, the horrors that they've experienced there. And so I've wanted Rikers to close from the day I knew what Rikers was. Um, but the idea that we're going to spend $11 billion to build new jails when there is no plan of I, I, it's absolutely outrageous and I, I strongly oppose that. Certainly a 40 story jail in Chinatown. Um, we don't need new jails. What we need is to invest in our communities and incarcerate fewer people. We need a district attorney who's, who's committed to decarceration, who's committed to investing in communities and thinking about the underlying issues people are facing. We are locking people up for mental health issues, for substance use disorder, for poverty, people who are experiencing homelessness and people who are youth. Um, and these are not the things that we should be doing. We certainly should not be building new jails. We certainly should be closing Rikers Island as soon as humanly possible. And Tony, thanks for that question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next question. Uh, Dennis, you've had your hand up a little while and we didn't get to you because you asked the question earlier, but why don't you go ahead now? Hello, Eliza. Hi. What is your view on bail reform? Well, thank you for that. Um, I have been a strong proponent of bail reform. I've gone to community meetings and spoke up at when people were trying to unfortunately roll it back part of the way, but I think bail reform doesn't quite go far enough. What, what I've seen is clients who are held in on bail who just simply could not afford to buy their freedom. We say that we have a presumption of innocence in this country, but that really only applies to people who are wealthy enough to buy their freedom. I am strongly in favor of ending money bail in its entirety, and I will do so on my first day as Manhattan District Attorney. We simply cannot incarcerate people for the balance of their bank account. And you know, when people talk about a dangerousness standard or adding that, that is nothing more than pure racism. Because I can tell you that the people who will be deemed to be racist are the people that I've represented. You know, My clients who are predominantly black and brown who stand up in front of judges and judges would say, oh yes, well that person should have bail set on them. There's no reason we should have money bail. The purpose of bail is supposed to be to ensure someone's return to court. That is not how it's being used. It's being used to disproportionately lock up lower income people, people of color, LGBTQIA folks, people with disabilities, those from marginalized communities. And it is unjust and cruel. It leads to longer prison sentence, worse plea outcomes, coerced and forced pleas. And we have to end money bail. Um, bail reform is great. And I'm, I'm so grateful to the people who, who were able to get it passed. I'm, I'm devastated about the rollbacks, not only to the bail aspect of it, but also to the blindfold law. For far too long, open file discovery has been, you know, something Cy Vance ran on back in 2009. And I can tell you, certainly never upheld that part of his promise. Um, we never received any open file discovery. It was something that even after bail reform was enacted, we had to beg beg for um, things to be turned over in a timely manner. And in my office, that would be the default. Everything would be turned over immediately. Thanks. Um, uh, I'm gonna let Carlton Burroughs ask the next question. Carlton. Thank you. It's about HPD again. And uh, thank you for providing this opportunity. Um, one question about HPD, why is no one able to go after HPD and prosecute them uh, and Marie Hendrickson should be in prison. And I have no shame in saying that. We've handed over documents upon documents showing proof of criminal activity and fraud and yet nothing gets done. Um, sorry. <clears throat> 
Are you willing to go after DOI and Margaret Garnett, who failed to investigate our allegations and, and, and the city council rendered uh, a decision that there's no fraud in the third party transfer program? Someone has to go after DOI because if you don't go after DOI, then that, that says that DOI is above the law. So we need an investigation on the Department of Investigations. And my third question, are you willing to prosecute you have, you have staff who are also participating in the predatory lending scheme and deliberate fraud with regards to the setup of the third party transfer program and the lack of completing work that, that, that's being done at HDFCs. Let's say for instance, on 644 Riverside Drive, they spent $46 million and the building is still falling apart. Thank you. Carlton, thanks for sharing that. And I'm so sorry that that's been going on. And I think it's, it's really something that is so typical of the way that our criminal legal system operates. I think you've heard other people say our criminal justice system is broken, but it's not. It's not broken. It's operating exactly as designed, which is to continue to marginalize certain people while being rigged in favor of others. And who is it rigged in favor of? People who are wealthy, well-connected, powerful, and it's rigged against everyone else. And I, I mean, I know that very well as a public defender, you know, representing over 3,000 people charged with crimes over the last 11 years and realizing that this is the way the system was designed to work. And I think it's incredibly important to recognize that those who've been the prime beneficiaries of it, who have been harming our communities, who have been doing things to hurt the same people, the very same people, <laughs> that our criminal legal system operates. Sorry, I have no idea who that is. Um, of course, that happens right now. And, and so I think that this is why we need someone who is committed to fighting against those who are powerful, those who are well-connected, those who are, who are harming our system, who are abusing their power and, and hurting people. And so absolutely, I'm committed to, to prosecuting people who are perpetrating fraud and harms on our communities. One more thing. What about the corrupt judges who are colluding with corrupt lawyers in favor of HPD? And what about judges who are getting apartments in HDFCs where they don't even qualify with the income guidelines? Listen, I think corruption is a huge issue and you know, I'm extremely committed to rooting it out because who does it hurt? Who does that hurt? It hurts the people who live in our communities. It hurts the lower income New Yorkers, the black and brown New Yorkers. It hurts people who are already at having being disadvantaged by the system and when people are taking advantage of that and taking apartments from people and you know continuing having you know lead paint in in NYCHA and all of these things it's all connected it's all this systemic oppression that exists and we need someone who's willing to fight back and I'm ready to do just that. Thanks uh, let's uh, move on to our next question I, I'm going to be calling on people who have asked questions before so I'm just reminding everybody else if you do have a question please check the participants button and then the raise hand and I will sneak you into the front of the line uh, Scott Kaplan go ahead please thank you um, how do you balance your calls for res restorative justice and rehabilitation with demands for justice Every time there is a killing, including killings in hate crimes against trans individuals, teenagers, and persons of color. That's a great question. And the rise in hate crimes has been, you know, quite disturbing to see. I mean, I think, you know, as recently as yesterday, we saw someone drive their car into a group of peaceful protesters. And you know, for far too long, people have not actually been held accountable for going after um, you know, marginalized members of our community. And certainly I will stand up for them. And I think that you know, it's been devastating to see. Um, but I do think that, that oftentimes in terms of the reason why I, I really fight for and speak out for rehabilitation and restorative justice is because we really do see um, situations where uh, that is what we should be doing because that's what helps everyone in the community. You know, today's victim is, you know, tomorrow's accused. And so many of my clients have been victims of, of violent crimes or sexual assaults um, and, and realizing that nothing has ever been done to think through how, how it has affected them. Um, you know, going after someone who burned your house down and burning their house down doesn't 
bring, do anything to bring your house back. You're still standing there in front of a pile of ashes, not knowing what to do. And so I think that bringing people together and having those conversations and figuring out how we can address things without just perpetuating, you know, the current system of lock them up, throw away the key, that mentality that doesn't actually keep us safe, that doesn't do anything to prevent reoffending. You know, that, that most, of, most people are not going away forever. And so people who are going to be returning to the community who have no mechanism to deal with whatever it is they were dealing with that maybe got them into that situation in the first place means that then that person will likely reoffend and sometimes the, the situation will get worse. You know, I often talk about a, a handful of years ago, I represented a young woman. She was a teenager at the time. Her name was Jessica and she was charged with gun possession. And the Manhattan DA's office was would not hear any of our pleas for mercy. They only wanted to see this young woman in jail and refused to offer a non-incarceratory sentence. And finally, we, we started begging judges and a judge allowed Jessica to participate in an alternative to incarceration program in which she excelled. She successfully completed the program. Two years later, I was so proud to, that she asked me to speak at her high school graduation. And she's now gainfully employed, engaged, has a baby on the way. And so I think that even in cases as serious as, as you know, firearm possession, that it shouldn't necessarily be addressed simply with a punitive prison sentence. And so I think it's just, you know, we have to start thinking about how to address things because the current system isn't working. It's not working, it's not keeping us safe. And so I think it's important to think beyond incarceration. Thanks. Uh, let's get to Theo Chino, who said his hand up for a while. Theo, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Question for all the candidate uh, and yourself. I run a website called Show the Book, trying to root out corruption. I've been through the various cycle of election and candidate, and I met many candidates in the last 10 years, and I gave up. I created La Shit List, where I put all the candidates, and every candidate has to get off La Shit List to get into the anti-corruption league. So yourself or anyone else just need to look at a movie called Poverty, Politics, and Profit to get the first step to get off the list. Will you get off the list and join the anti-corruption league and follow basically the basic principle and the basic tenet to represent the community who you got elected from? And that's the idea. Uh, that's go for every candidate yourself and anyone on this call. Uh, Theo, thank you for your question and for just being such an engaged member of our, you know, democratic politics here in New York City. Um, I will definitely look into it and I would love to know more about it, but I am definitely committed to rooting out corruption. And so it's a really worthy cause you've taken on and I'm, I'm appreciative of, of that. Uh, Avi Gross, uh, can you uh, give us one last quick question here? Yeah, uh, I also just want to use this opportunity to say thank you to Jeremy and Patrick. I've seen a lot of moderators, and this is the most fair, um, efficient one I've ever seen. So thank you, guys. My quick question is, um, you, you know, this, I'm sorry if it seems like a provocative question, and it goes back to corruption, but it turns out, you know, if you're someone who makes um, anywhere between 60 to $150,000 and one fine day, someone very powerful offers you a bribe of let's say $2 million. It turns out that for a human being, it is very hard to walk away from that. And I know we all would like to think that we would be the ones that would just say, oh no, I'm, I'm not corruptible. But it turns out that it actually is a serious uh, problem and unfortunately, this has been going on so pervasively and you say you want to take on corruption, but you, you have to understand what you're going up against. You're going up against people with unlimited resources who can literally bribe anyone and everyone they choose to. So my question is, how can you create a, a system that's efficient enough to protect New Yorkers by somehow neutralizing this very serious threat of bribery. Um, well, Avi, first of all, thank you for your question. And also I agree, this is an incredibly well-moderated, um, you know, very big group of people. And so I'm grateful to the, to the organizers. Um, but I think that that's true, that it's such a huge problem and that there is, you know, often not accountability for those who are wealthy and powerful. And, you know, they're, 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 bribes are swept under the rug, you know, there's no 
commission that like hold that, that looks into their misconduct. And when there is, it's something that becomes a huge problem. I mean, we've seen that even, you know, with the DA lobbying group, for example, you know, DASNY is, is, you know, led the racist campaign against bail reform. And, you know, the, the, all the current DAs in New York are a member of that, are members of that group. And so, you know, thinking through it is, I think, the way that we fix this is by by electing people who are outsiders, people who who have no connection to any of these, you know, political organizations or people who are the the most powerful people in our city. And so, I think that that's the way that we think through this. And having someone who's like me, who has spent my entire career as a public defender fighting against the powerful, you know, fighting on behalf of the underdogs of this city. Um, that is how we will make real transformative change to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And I'm so grateful to everyone who's here today and who's asked such thoughtful and engaged questions and to our wonderful organizers. Great, thanks very much, Eliza. That's uh, the end of our time. It's good to see you again. You um, uh, Avi, thanks very much. Although I should say to everybody, uh, for the sake of time, please hold all of your compliments of today's moderators until the end of the meeting. We'll, we'll, we'll make time for it then. Thanks. <laughs> Patrick, do you want to take it away for our next Sure, time? and I'll respectfully disagree. <laughs> no, hold it all to the end, Eliza and uh, Avi. Thank you, guys. Uh, next up is Liz Crotty. Liz, are you with us? We're going to have four minutes, if you would kindly, for an introduction um, and the remaining uh, 16 minutes or so for uh, 14 minutes or so for questions and answers. Liz? Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for everyone for having me. And thanks to the VID. I am a member of the VID and I have always enjoyed going to the meetings and I know how seriously you all take issues and are really a lifeblood of the village in New York City, and I would, I, I'm happy to be in front of you. I'm also slightly nervous. I won't lie. Um, I, my name is Liz Crotty. I'm running for Manhattan DA. I am a born and raised New Yorker. I was born in Stuyvesant Town, and I grew up there. I went to grammar school there and high school there. I went to Fordham Law School. I mean, I grew up in the 60s. I'm sorry, not in the 60s. I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and know firsthand what the impact of crime and civil unrest can have on its residents. I feel like with coronavirus, we are in a tough time. I went to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in, in 2000, and I was an assistant DA for six years. I worked there, and when I was there in both the trial division, and then I later went to the investigative division. In the investigative division, I worked on the oil for food case, where we were, were doing an investigation into Saddam Hussein and sanctions under the oil for food program and how money through, moves through the Middle East. This took me to my next job at a firm for two years where I investigated um, on the behalf of 9-11 families under the Anti-Terrorism Act, the um, state-sponsored terrorism and how you can go after banks and state actors for the acts of 9-11. But after two years in civil law, I decided, you know what, I wanted to start my own practice and I started my own practice with a colleague from the DA's office, Jeremy Saland, and we started Karate Saland. I started a small business here 12 years ago, and I've been running a small business. In that time, I have represented close to 3,000 people. I have done, I am the practitioner in this race. I have been practicing law for 20 years. I have done close to 4,000 cases in the trenches, every day and that under 3,000 of them are as defense cases and the rest as a prosecuting attorney. I understand the system top to bottom. I understand how we can make change. I always say this, but I think we need to clean up how the practice of law works. I think that the DA's office has to be held accountable and they have to work within the system and on day one you can make changes of limiting misdemeanor cases to a certain amount of time, not contesting 730 results, using orders properly investigating your cases. I think these changes will make monumental changes on day one. I also think that you need to look at, I, I've done a lot of more than anybody in this case, in this group of candidates, I've done more victim cases. I've done domestic violence cases, both a prosecutor and a defense attorney. The system needs to change right now. DAs have to be assigned only to sex crimes and only to domestic violence, be trained in those, those units. How, what the current case law is, how do we deal with trauma and also hiring 
social workers to staff those bureaus so that victims can hear their voice and their voice can be heard and that they can work for decisions to come through through these criminal cases. I think that's a very important point. I'm here because I think you can bring practical solutions and common sense solutions and understand that we all live in this city together and that we want to all live in this city together. And thanks, that's why I'm running for Manhattan DA. Thanks, Liz. Uh, move right to questions. Um, we have someone denominated as A. Wilson. Ms. Wilson. Hi there. Hi, this is Annie. I'm Annie Wilson. Hi, Annie. Thank and you. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I, it's a two part question, but first of all, relating to immigrants and the protection of police informants by the current office. In this case, uh, we're talking a homicide that was uh, prosecuted and convicted that involved stalking that I as an undocumented facilitated in getting the evidence, bringing witness. And um, as a result, the documents I had requested in order to get my U visa has been blocked by your office. I appealed the decision three times. And I am wondering why the district attorney's office at this time does not support people that have helped get justice in our community. And as a result, I have had to live in this situation for since 2007. This has been an ongoing problem. And now my housing situation with a corrupt nonprofit has forced me out of my home with the force of violence and is now seeking to impose a gag order to silence me from speaking up, especially since I went on to uh, Brian Lair regarding the lack of oversight by HPD in this matter. Thank you, Andy. So let's, the let's, city let's... is riddled with corruption and to all the candidates and um, Sprotty, what, what are you gonna do given that there are so many issues in the city to at least protect immigrants and protect people that have assisted the community and are being now um, abused by corrupt housing developers. Thank you. Well, Ms. Wilson, I'm very sorry about your, your situation. I do think U visas should definitely be issued to people who have helped with cases and to the extent that, that has not been your case, I, I, I apologize. I think U visas are very important. I think you have to protect all the people who cooperate with law enforcement and that, and that includes immigrants. I think immigrants are very important. They are the lifeblood of New York. We were all immigrants once. And I think there is a, a distrust of immigrants to come forward and to help for precisely these reasons. I think that you know all the candidates, including myself, want to have more transparency and accountability within the system. And I think that that goes to how do you get a U visa and, and helping shepherd through that process. So I, I'm sorry for your, for your situation, but when I become the DA, I hope to have a more transparent and helpful system in which we can help people like yourselves. Thank you, Darren Warren. I'm sorry, David Warren, my apologies. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Same question again. Um, Please explain your approach to handling cases in which there has been a serious injury or death involving a motor vehicle. What department in your office would handle such cases? How would you assess whether a crime has been committed in crashes involving one, fatalities, critical injuries, serious injuries in the penal code? Also, how would you go about prosecuting hit and run drivers and would you support a law to uh, make a stiffer penalty similar to drunk driving? Uh, hi, David. Thank you so much for your question. I know we've talked about this offline as well. Listen, I think that having crashes and having victims have to be treated, they are treated and they have to be treated very seriously. I do think that investigation is the proper thing. I think you have to look at what was the driver doing? What was the, were they sober? Were they texting? Were they speeding? These are all the things that have to go into wh what happened with the crash 
and and how do you hold somebody civil um, criminally responsible for veh vehicular crimes? So I think vehicular crimes are important. I think they should be prosecuted. But you know, at the same time, I do think that there is legislation, and I have I have written to you about this. Is that you know I believe in the proof beyond a reasonable doubt standard for all criminal cases. And that is what we're held to. And I do find some of the recent legislation where I do support the spirit of it, but I do think having the mens rea taken out of it is problematic. I think that's the basics to criminal law, but I'm happy to work with advocacy groups to have a safer environment for all of us and have less crashes and to prosecute vehicular crimes as they happen. What about hit and runs? Well, hit yes, hit and runs would, would include with that, and you would you would want to do all the investigation and you videotape, and cell phones and nine one one calls. These are all the things that go into properly investigating cases, and I think that these are very important cases to prosecute. Okay, thank you, Kathy Slowinski. You're next. Hi, <clears throat> hi, Liz. Uh, I was at another forum where you spoke. And you had a position, you were uh, for mandatory minimums. Is that still your position? And can you explain why you are against getting rid of mandatory minimums? Sure. I was When I was asked the question, I was taking it under first impression of mandatory minimums and which apply to first arrest, which there are no mandatory minimums except for A and B felonies. I do think mandatory minimums have their time and place. Also, as the practitioner, and these, I have been asked about this, I would charge misdemeanors on all felony complaints. That means that there is always an opening for which to do a, to dismiss the top charges and to have a misdemeanor charge as the way. But I do think mandatory minimums are set by the legislature and they're the ones who set them and the judges follow them. So as I would follow the law, as a way of being a district attorney and fairness, I would put on a misdemeanor on indictments so that you could always have the ability to have a lesser included on any indictment so that the mandatory minimum would need not apply if that is what was right for the case. Thanks. Dr. Gil Horowitz, you haven't had a chance to speak yet, so if you'd like to ask your question next, sir. Hi, this can is you, Andrew Wilson, can, part can two. You, with, sorry. Hello. Liz Crotty, I didn't get the second part of my question asked. Uh, Annie, if I, if I may just ask you, Annie, if I may just ask you to wait for a moment, um, we're going to let we're going to recognize Dr. Horowitz to speak, uh, and then I promise. Thank, we'll come back. <clears throat> thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, my video is not working. I'm a voting member of the VID and also a member of the DID. Once upon a time, on this executive committee, a lifetime New Yorker for 84 years. Um, some years ago, Richard Aborn ran for uh, Manhattan DA, and he pointed out that the office was in the dark ages in technology. I know we have a host of issues of systemic racism and unfairness. What I'm asking is, do you have any thoughts on how technology, better transparency from data retrieval, modern data retrieval, would give us tools to identify and come up with solutions to this myriad of awful things that happen to the poor people of color, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, I think technology, I think they have, when I was there from 2000, 2006, it was not so great, but what I've seen, it has progressed. But I do think what you want to do is I think you can track police. I think one of the things you can do is track police officers, track their complaints, track how many of those complaints are founded, are, have, have been founded, how many have not been founded. And I think what you really need to do is have a, a community bureau that talks specifically with police precincts and the community bureau and goes over all the different complaints that come through the system. And so you can see who is the arresting officer, what are those problems with those cases, how are those cases being dealt with. So you can really see from the police officer where it's coming from which precinct and which police officer. And I think technology allows us to, to address the, 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 con the disconnect between the police, the arrest, the charge, and the trial. So I think that that's just one of the very ways that you can use um, technology to track the information as it comes in and out of the district attorney's office. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Annie, I promised we would come back to you uh, and I want to do that. And then um, after that, we'll have Bill Ferns and that'll be, I suspect, our final question for Roddy. 
Can you just remind me the second the second question? What was and, the second part of your question? All right, Annie, I promise we'll come back to you after this if you're still uh, able to unmute, but we're going to go now to Bill Fern's program moving. Bill? Hi, so I'm just going to repeat my questions I've asked previously. Uh, will you commit to not taking any campaign donations from police unions or the officers of those unions? Uh, I mean, you know, like the president, not all the membership, but the, the pre president, the vice president of those unions. And also, what is your position on independently investigating and prosecuting police when they kill unarmed uh, citizens of New York? Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, as, as was reported erroneously in city and state, I will not take police money. I think that you, you can, I would, however, I would not take police money, but I would, however, take their endorsement. And the reason why I would take their endorsement is because I do believe fundamentally the job is you work in partnership with the police. Police make arrests and you decide what to prosecute the case. So there is some semblance of having to work, you know, in a way to, that's how cases are prosecuted. Um, secondly, I do think that the ind the independent investigation, I think it's already referred to the AG's office. That was a, a change made by the governor, I think a couple of years ago, where there is no, um, weapon found in a police killing, those cases are immediately referred to the attorney general now. Not, and they are not investigated by the district attorney's office. That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Andy, coming back to you, if you're able to unmute. Okay. Um, let me ask you, uh, Ms. Crotty, about your managerial experience um, specifically and how that approach would come to the office. And another question that was asked earlier in the chat, which I think is related. Um, yeah, I'm muted. Around, oh, you know what? I'll withdraw my question. I'll let Annie go. Annie? Yes, hi, Liz Crotty. Um, I suppose I wanted everyone on this call to understand that with the U visa and the immigrants and for those that have facilitated towards the investigation of a crime, that the decision is discretionary by the district attorney's office. And that discretion can be abused. So I just hope that all those listening and the candidates understand that this discretion issue is a problem within the system. Thank you. And uh, with regard to the housing corruption, there is no recourse. Um, some of us that I'm involved with have gone to the attorney general. Okay, can I answer that advocate? question right? No can one I is doing the, it. Yes. Can I answer the question? I yes. think when I was in the office, what they had in the Office of Special Prosecutions is they had a walk-in component from the public. I would look to reinstate that, that so people could come directly to the DA's office and bring complaints like housing fraud or ha uh, the DOI or other situations where they can bring those directly to the attention of the district attorney's office without getting a lawyer and make those complaints and we can start those investigations as, as the complaints are made. So that's how I deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, with a couple of minutes left for Ms. Crotty, I just want to ask um, again, with leading oh, into the, the managerial? Yeah, your managerial, both, uh, how you would manage the offices, what your experience is, but also in a related uh, question comes from our chat, which is, will you pledge to hire deputies and bureau chiefs who reflect the diversity of Manhattan with very level experience? And I would just expand on that and say, how? Sure. Well, first of all, the, the, there's three there's three parts of the DA's office that I don't think this ever gets discussed. There's the trial division, there's the investigative division, and there's the administration part of the job. The district attorney's office, I believe, is under 500 attorneys um, who staff those, and then the rest is support staff. So I think the way I would run the office is I've started a law firm from the ground up for the past 12 years. I've been running that firm, and I have also um, had close to 3,000 clients. So running a small business in New York City and in Manhattan is no small feat. I would It's a micro level to the macro level, but I've been running a business. I understand bottom lines, I understand budgets, and I understand being held accountable for your work. And I think those are all things that come into how do you run the DA's office? I think the, the, the DA's office is, um, what does diversity mean to you? I think that the, the the district attorney's office is somewhat diverse. I think it can always be more diverse. I think that having people from New York City and and from locally sourced lawyers, I think always know that what's going on in communities and how communities work. As I like to say to the gang people the other day, I was like, I understand I am from a neighborhood. So I understand the difference of being from a neighborhood and being from a gang. 
gang. I think that you have to really look at these things and you also have to, for diversity, I mean, I always say this too, is that you really have to have an emotional IQ. When you are dealing with the public, you are dealing with the public and seeing people at their worst, at victims at their worst, and you have to have an empathy. And I think if you have an emotional IQ to really deal with people, and this is more specific to the trial division than the investigative division or appeals, but I do really think that that's where diversity comes into play and really having an, an ability to, to talk and relate to people because that's you know three-fourths of what the job is doing in terms of really coming in and how to prosecute and what are the right prosecutorial decisions to make. And I think that that speaks to having a diverse workforce, both in, in, in all levels of diversity, not just racially, ethnically, religiously, LBGQT, like everything has to be diverse so it can be reflective of all our communities that we represent here in Manhattan. Thank you, Liz. Um, I see a couple of hands have gone up, but um, hopefully they'll be able to carry over into Jer with Jeremy into the next candidate. And I will throw it over to Jeremy. Okay, thanks very much, uh, uh, Liz Crowdy, for joining us. Um, we're going to move on to our third hour and our uh, uh, seventh candidate, Lucy Lang. Uh, Lucy, are you with us here? I am. Good afternoon, Jeremy. Thanks so much to the downtown clubs for convening this important conversation. My name is Lucy Lang, and as a national criminal justice reform leader and a former assistant district attorney, I know that the job of the district attorney encompasses far more than prosecution alone. In fact, prosecution is really a fraction of the district attorney's job. The district attorney must take a collaborative approach to working with communities must be focused on prevention and rehabilitation. And the next DA has to take a holistic 360 degree view of everyone the system touches. In 2015, I handled a case in which a young father was shot and killed on Super Bowl Sunday by two masked men. During the course of a many month investigation, I became close to his mother and ultimately tried the case, and the two masked men were convicted by a jury after trial. The morning after the conviction, I called the mother of the young man who'd been killed and asked her how she felt. And she said, I slept all night for the first time since my son was killed. But when I woke up, all I could think about were the moms of those two boys. And she was referring to the mothers of the men who had just been convicted of murdering her son. Her empathy led me to think about how I could expand the practices of the district attorney's office to integrate the experiences of everyone the system touches. And I created a first of its kind college and prison program that brings assistant district attorneys inside of New York state prisons to study criminal justice alongside incarcerated students and to work together to develop ideas for change. I have trained 80 assistant district attorneys in Manhattan through that course. Under my administration, it would be mandatory for every assistant district attorney. It has become a gold standard for legal education for prosecutors and is being replicated in district attorney's offices around the country. I have also been an advocate for ending the practice of felon disenfranchisement. Imagine a world in which my opponents and I all had to go inside of New York's prisons and talk to the people who are most impacted by the decisions we're going to make and ask them for their vote. That would result in a drastically different looking system. All of my work has been grounded in connection to and work with the people who are most impacted. And in my time as director of the Institute for Innovation in Prosecution, I worked alongside family members who lost loved ones to police violence, including Valerie Bell, the mother of Sean Bell, Valerie Castile, the mother of Philando Castile, Victoria Davis, the sister of Delron Small, all of whom I'm honored have just endorsed me to create protocols to ensure accountability for officers who commit misconduct and who murder citizens. My work of building trauma-informed best practices curriculum for prosecutors was informed by my work alongside the survivors of Harvey Weinstein and other victims of heinous sexual violence. And I'm honored to have received an endorsement from the silence breakers who bravely came forward. It's also as a result of my work with those remarkable women that I launched this campaign with an equal access policy 
that is committed to ensuring that no one, no matter who they are, or who their lawyer is, has better access to the district attorney than public defenders or anyone who is charged with a crime. And there will be no backdoor backroom meetings under my administration. I know how to transform the system because I have worked to reform it from inside and outside alongside the people who are most impacted by it. So I'm running to realize the full potential of what the district attorney can do. Prioritize prevention and healing, uphold racial and gender equity, which have never been more important than they are now, and promote the dignity of every New Yorker. Great, thank you. Um, let's, uh, let's move on to some questions. Uh, I see a hand up from, uh, uh, from Michael Skates. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Yes, hi, hello. Hi, hello. yes, go ahead. Hi, um, so I have, I have a concern. So I get that, um, a lot of the candidates, uh, you know, um, are promoting this progressive reform. Um, I understand why I'm African American myself, and I have um, grown up in a very um, dangerous neighborhood. So I get it. However, what are we doing about the gangs on the street? What are we doing about? That person who innocently killed somebody on the street just because they're standing on the corner. I'm not talking about police killing black folks. I get that. And I get that everybody is riding with it, although that's been going on for centuries. But what are we doing to protect the, the communities of color from ourselves? What are you guys gonna do about that? Ms. The Gates. gangs, these kids that are getting innocently killed, families that are being torn apart. I heard one candidate on here brag about she had an alternative sentence for a person who had gun possession. I get that that's a, a um, star for your career, but it's not a star for the hood because that person comes back and we are the people who suffer. I'm not in the hood no more, I'm just speaking. I wanna know the we... plan for the real people of color. What are you guys gonna do about the neighborhoods that are struggling in addition to the police, you know, conduct? Thank you, Thank you. can we, can mm -hmm. we let uh, Ms. Lang answer Go that? ahead, I'm listening. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Gates, I'm so glad that you raised that and I hear and feel the passion in your voice. I am the only candidate in the race who has responded to the scene of a street homicide, who has talked to a mother whose child has been shot in the crossfire on a basketball court in their neighborhood. And I am deeply concerned about the increase that we have seen in recent months in gun violence in our communities. I believe the next district attorney must invest in a fast track gun court that will ensure that all services are brought to bear on gun possession cases and that people are supported. And we try to get at the root reasons why young people pick up guns, that instead of categorizing people as gang members, that we view young people as young people and double down on supporting them before they get caught up into the system. That also means a serious investment in wraparound services for victims. Because as traumatized as we know people are going through the system when they've committed a crime, there is arguably nothing more traumatizing than being the victim of a violent crime or being a family member who's victimized by violent crime. And of course the system has not always supported those victims to the extent that it could and should. So I am invested in bringing in interdisciplinary experts to the office, including social workers, psychologists, clinicians, to work with both people who are charged and assess what an appropriate response is to ensure prevention in the future, 
and to assess people who are victimized and their families and help support people so that everyone is able to thrive. I'm also committed to partnering with other agencies who do just those things. Think about the amazing programs that are coming out of the Department of Education, the BRAVE program against bullying, the Positive Learning Collaborative, the ways in which the, the district attorney's office can help support public education. The, the district attorney's office can help support public health systems who should be catching cases related to people who are suffering from substance misuse and mental health because the, the criminal justice system has for far too long been a backstop for those kinds of cases. So I so appreciate the question and am with you and think that together we can solve this problem by investing resources in what we know works rather than in unduly long prison sentences that return people to communities worse off. Thanks. Uh, let's move on to uh, James Yates. James, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, the current district attorneys advocated um, introducing uh, preventive detention called public safety, whatever you want to call it, and algorithms in bail determinations. In other words, predicting whether you think someone in the future might commit a crime and holding them in. What's your position on that? The use of risk assessment instruments in determining whether or not someone is likely to, to recommit a crime, for one thing, um, doesn't make sense in our current statutory scheme, judges, you know, given that, that judges are not permitted to assess whether or not someone is a risk to their community. And one of the biggest issues with respect to these risk assessment instruments is the concern that they have baked in uh, racialized elements already and will result in the kind of racist outcomes that we have already seen in the use of preventative detention. So where I would invest as district attorney is in building out supervised release programming to end the use of cash bail, but ensure that when a young person who may be at risk of, of committing a crime again, who may have myriad needs, is leaving court in order to go home and, and remain in their community to wait while their case is pending, if that person leaves court with a credible messenger or a peer navigator or someone who is appropriately suited to help make sure that that person is going to return to court and comply with the terms of their release. Thanks. Um, uh, Alberto Mercado, you have a question? Yes, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, what is your view on alternative sentencing? Uh, the reason I'm asking is, as you're probably aware, many uh, district attorneys and judges throughout this country, uh, supposedly if someone, well, when someone steals something from a supermarket and it's a 15, 16 year old Latino, black and brown person. Well, creatively what the DA and the judges do is they have that, that young person stand in front of the supermarket with a sign that says, I stole from this supermarket on such and such a date, and I promise never to do it again or something like that. They, 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 they each cater to each, uh, to, to each uh, problem that they have. And why do you think that perhaps maybe that hasn't happened here in New York City? Because I haven't seen that here, because the majority of those people who stand with a sign that said, I will never steal a car again, I will never rob this house again, it, the, the, there is no repeat, you know, crimes of that. Could it be because the civil rights attorneys here in New York City uh, have an issue with that and are protecting the, the, the defendant's uh, civil rights? Mr. Mercado- As, a, as opposed to going to, to Rikers or something like that too. A couple of the really compelling points that you raise are the fact that the next district attorney must absolutely prioritize addressing racial injustice. And one of the ways that we have seen the worst racial injustices in New York City is in determinations of what cases get indicted and what cases get alternative responses to sentencing. But I think that, that one of the things that's incredibly interesting about what you talk about is that we have built out most places in this country refer to alternatives to incarceration. Incarceration should be the alternative. It should be the last resort. So I like to think really of what the next district attorney, what I commit to doing as the next district attorney is building 
a system of responsive sentencing of the kind you're describing, a system where the conduct and the person and the victim are all assessed and a decision is made about what an appropriate response is, rather than relying on cooker cut, cookie cutter mandatory minimums or pigeonholing people into programs that maybe don't fit them, but expanding the menu of options of what we can do to respond to people who harm one another or harm our communities. And that may include community service. It may include restorative justice options. It may include pro-social programming and education. All of those things should be on the table for responsive sentencing. And we need to stop talking about them as alternatives to incarceration because incarceration should be an absolute last resort. And it's incumbent on the next district attorney to build out partnerships and pathways that will facilitate precisely the kind of creative problem solving that you're talking about. Thanks. Uh, let me move on. And can I just remind everybody, we're trying to keep the questions as short as possible to 30 seconds so we can hear more from the candidate. Uh, Jim Forat, I see, uh, I see your hand up. Go ahead, please. Thank you. My question has to do with new technologies and you've been an advocate for using new technology both in policing and in the district attorney's office. A recent documentary that is now streaming called Code Bias showed how the technology isn't always fair. And in that particular documentary, it was about the racial aspect of technology. I'd like you to talk a little bit about the pros and most importantly, the cons of the dependence on new technologies and surveillance material that is potentially used in a court case. I'm so glad that you asked that because we need to stop the practice of recording information and, and, and searching information of people just living their lives. Surveillance, data, technology is a, a critical piece of, of crime solving all the more so in this era when we're seeing even more an increase in crimes that are being committed through the use of technology. That said, for all the reasons you described, it has to be done incredibly carefully and with court oversight. So I am an advocate for intense court oversight of everything from um, search warrants for cell phones and social media materials to making sure that, uh, that cases are sealed so that people's records don't follow them electronically throughout their life. And I think that the next district attorney is going to have a lot of work to do to make sure that there is no reliance on databases that are tracking people simply going to the store, socializing with their friends, et cetera. And I'm absolutely committed to making sure that that's the case. But one of the really promising things about the shutdown of the cr criminal justice system to the extent that it has happened during COVID is the increased use in, in remote connection. And in the years I spent as an assistant district attorney, I over and over again saw how many people who had been victimized were challenged to come down to the, the office. Maybe they were afraid, and of course we often would see, especially in immigrant communities, that people were concerned that involvement with law, with law enforcement would inure to their detriment. And so to, um, to Ms. Wilson's questions earlier, I'm absolutely committed to expanding the use of U visas and protecting immigrant communities, but technology can help give people more access. It can help for people to connect with someone who's investigating their case remotely. And it can also help ensure that district attorneys can go out into communities and engage with people on the ground rather than expecting people to get childcare, take a day off work, all of the things that make it incredibly challenging for people who are victimized to cooperate with the criminal justice system. So under my administration, the use of technology will be done with an eye towards supporting everyone who comes through the system, people who are charged with crimes and people who are victimized. Thanks, let's get uh, one more question, I think, uh, this one from Rick Braun. Rick? Hi, Lucy. Um, you said, use the terminology, our current laws. Do you believe that the bail law should allow the judge to, to consider dangerousness to prevent somebody from going out in the community when he or she sets bail 
And could you elaborate a little more on what you said about alternatives to incarcerating somebody um, after they've been accused of a crime, uh, alternatives in terms of helping them out in the community to make sure they'll come back to court, which is there, the purpose of bail, as you know. There are two myths, as I see it, in bail in New York State. One is the myth of cash bail at all, because cash bail is set at a level that people cannot afford to pay in order to detain them. The other is the myth that judges don't factor in someone's risk to the community because even though it may be cloaked in, this person is unlikely to return to court, very often the subtext is there is a risk. We are the only state in the country that doesn't permit a judge to consider whether or not someone might be a risk in setting bail. And I think of the case of um, James Jackson who came to New York with the stated intention of killing people of color, did kill a person of color and cash bail was set, but told police when he was arrested that his intent was to kill more people of color. That's not a person who even if he could pay $500,000 should be permitted out on bail. That is a person who is a stated risk to the community. So we do need to reassess and end cash bail and ensure that the vast majority of people are given the resources they need to stay home and wait out their day in court at home with the support of their community and their families, but that people who truly are a risk to the community are assessed in a race neutral way in order to end cash bail. And I, I wanted to just say to the folks who raised questions that they wanted put to every candidate that I, I did hear you and Ms. Chung, uh, rather Ms. Sito raised the inclusive workforce question. And I would direct you to my website where I have a comprehensive plan on building out a mission aligned diverse workforce and the training that I will require for every member of that workforce. Mr. Warren, with respect to vehicular violence, I responded to a devastating crash in 2010 in which a woman who was about the age I am now was tragically murdered by a car named woman, young filmmaker named Karen Schmier. And I carry that case with me. I prosecuted that case as a murder and I am committed to handling cases of vehicular violence by expanding the, the use of, of vehicular violence uh, prosecutions in the office. Um, Ms. Atia raised questions about gun violence, which we talked about, and I have a comprehensive plan for that on my website. Um, and if there are others, I really, I welcome folks to, to direct them to me at lucy at votelucylang.com. There are 16 comprehensive plans on my website, which is votelucylang.com. I have built those plans in collaboration with the most directly impacted members of our community over the course of many years of service to the community and in the context of my work on implementing progressive prosecution reforms with district attorneys all across the country, including in offices that are twice the size of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. So thank you so much to all of you for including me today. And I, I really do hope to continue the conversation with all of you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Lucy Lang. Um, and uh, Patrick, you can introduce our next candidate. Thanks, Jeremy. We have two more candidates uh, who are joining us today. Uh, and thank you to all of the candidates. Tahani Abushi is next. Tahani, are you able to unmute yourself? Nope, I'm here. There we are. Okay. Where is yours? You have four minutes to introduce yourself and then we'll take two minutes of questions. Thank you so much. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for um, the Downtown Democratic Club for hosting this forum. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, be in a new format that allows me to actually engage with you and answer questions and have uh, longer discussions. Uh, I'm a civil rights lawyer. Um, and for the last 10 years, I have been defending against discrimination, excessive force by the police. And I represent children who are sexually assaulted in schools. And I'm running to be Manhattan District Attorney to transform this office away from a place that tears families apart to one that builds them up and invests in our communities. Now, this fight is very personal to me. When I was 14, my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison. And overnight, my mother became a single parent of 10 kids, the youngest being six years old. 
And there was a moment in the courtroom where the judge had interrupted the proceedings and asked the prosecutor, what are you gonna do with all these kids? And without hesitation, she said, they're not my problem. And that is the moment the system became my problem. A system that can tear down a family, send a chill throughout an entire community and walk away with zero accountability. And so it inspired me to become a lawyer to stand by families like mine and push back on systems of authority, like the NYPD, like the district attorney's office, and sometimes the Department of Education and the fire department to actually change policies. And I'm the only candidate here that has navigated these adversarial waters and actually made a change in all of these agencies. And that's what it's going to take to have a district attorney's office that is transparent, accountable, and collaborative. One that centers justice around you, people, not money, not privilege, and not a badge. And that is the only way we are going to have a, a society that is stable. And for me, when I think of public safety and my obligation to keep the public safe, for me, that's stability, housing stability, education stability, access to employment, the opportunity to have a second chance uh, and grow from your past. Because this is the only office that is directly responsible for the future of your family and the trajectory of generations to come. When you incarcerate one person, when you criminalize one person, you incarcerate and criminalize an entire family, an entire community. And when you look at graduation rates, homeownership rates, um, entrepreneurship, employment, you have to look at exactly what this office is doing. So I'm running to shrink the footprint of this office and get it out of our way so we can use these funds to invest in our communities and address root causes of crimes by collaborating and partnering with our community-based organizations that have been doing this work for a very long time to actually come up with permanent solutions. And so I'm honored to be running. This is a historic campaign uh, and I'm honored to be here with you and hear your questions and work together on creating a future where it's safe and just for all of us. Thank you so much. Honey, thank you. Uh, first question for you will come from Kelly Grace Price. Kelly, are you able to unmute? Okay, Kelly, I promise we'll come back to you um, uh, Dr. Gil Horowitz, you are next. All right. Uh, can you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Go Thank ahead. you. Okay. I am, by the way, a psychologist, uh, hospital, school, research. And yes, we have some good ideas that could help any district attorney's office. Our research tells us punishment generally does not work. Moving along from that, uh, my question to the remaining two candidates and backward to the others who no longer can answer, you seem as a group to have some very good ideas. As a group, you seem to what I'll call get it, a change from what we've had in the past where the candidates for the most part were part of the old boy power network go along to get along and use tactics that seem to promote the interests of the powerful and rich, uh, but really did not work that well for them either. Um, what distinguishes you? I think we're gonna get a good one no matter which one we pick, so it seems. Uh, what distinguishes you from the many good candidates, excellent, I would say, candidates we have, as do you seem excellent, why you, as opposed to the others, what is your hallmark that makes you even better? Thank you for that question. And I think it's really important here because when we talk about experience, right, we have to realize what kind of experience are we looking for here? <clears throat> as you said, um, this issue has been going on for decades. The discrimination, uh, the targeting of communities of color, the targeting of our children. And many of the candidates here have had the chance to undo a lot of what we're now fighting for. And so when we talk about experience, you have the option. Do you want experience of comfort and complacency in the face of these growing numbers, in the face of the destabilization of our families? Or do you want some 
anybody that's experienced the navigating these agencies and these pressures to usher in new ideas and change the culture of an office. I'm the only one to have done that. And I started with the NYPD. And I've been able to not only sue the NYPD, but sit across the table from the police commissioner and rewrite policy. That's what this district attorney has to do. It's take an office that for the last century has had four district attorneys and for all of the district attorneys have only been white males and change it on its head. I'm the only one to have done that with the NYPD, with the fire department, with our department of education. And that's important because you need to have the experience of how the court systems work, how the district attorney's office works, the NYPD and its interrelation with all the other agencies in our city and the larger law enforcement community. And you're gonna have to change people's mind and be prepared for an exodus um, as you bring in your new office of people that are going to further your vision. And my plan to do it is with the collaborative body of people like yourselves, impacted community members, accused and victims alike, formerly incarcerated, teachers, psychologists, defense attorneys, civil rights lawyers, social workers, to help us see this office and its purpose from a public health perspective. Um, and I've been doing it for 10 years. I've been going up against the grain and getting things done uh, and building partnerships um, from unlikely places. And that's what sets me apart from every other candidate in this race. Thank you. Kelly Grace, Kelly Grace, Kelly Grace, Kelly Grace, Kelly Grace, Kelly Grace, Kelly Grace. I'm out of feedback there. We're gonna have to mute that one. Um, okay. Uh, I see my new name, Amy Chen. I don't think you've had a chance to ask a question. Amy, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you leading with the issue of families and that perspective. I'm particularly concerned about our current child welfare system and uh, foster care youth. Uh, I've been reading about um, so many of them riding the subways in the current pandemic uh, as, a, as a means of stable housing the subway system. So I'd like to understand your role, how you consider your role as a Manhattan DA in keeping families intact and keeping children, particularly children of color, out of the foster care system. Uh, I really appreciate that question. Um, children are um, a very soft spot in my heart and my practice. Um, any of them who are bullied, harassed, sexually assaulted, and in their suspension hearings, um, you will find me by their side. Um, a lot of people will tell you things the district attorney can do to make change. A lot of it will come from things it can stop doing. And one is to stop interfering um, with families trying to attain stability uh, by incarceration or criminalizing them. Get out the way and take some of this billion dollar funding and contribute to organizations that are helping families make ends meet. Um, I think that a lot of the child welfare type cases and negligence comes out from families that need help, whether or not having enough food, not having enough clean clothes, not being able to pay the rent. And these are cries for help. And, and for me, when my father was incarcerated, we had to leave our childhood home. We had to leave our schools. The stigma uh, made us move out of our neighborhood. And so I grew up in a destabilized environment. And uh, anything that I could get my hands on uh, to make me feel like I had some routine, some consistency, uh, I held on to with the tightest grip. For me, that was school. Um, and so to create an environment in school where kids can safely seek help and families can safely seek help and respond with resources, not crime and punishment, I think is imperative. It's imperative to allow for safe reporting. It's imperative to allow for help. Uh, and it's imperative to allow for a partnership where we are bringing resources into the homes of the families across our city, particularly children of color um, who are criminalized for being just that, children. Um, and I do believe that the penal code for the elementary, junior high school and high school um, children act as the penal code in criminal court. I represented many of them in suspension hearings, and it's a full-blown trial. They're subject to the rules of evidence and cross-examination. Um, and then they're expected to go to school the next day and say good morning to their teachers and the principal and learn. And so a lot of this um, 
is a form of disruption to that stability in an already destabilized environment. And so I think that the district attorney's office can lend its massive budget to that investing in families. Great, thank you. Um, I want to go to David Warren. David? Hi, good afternoon again. <laughs> My question is going to be the same to you. Please explain your approach to handling cases in which there has been a serious, serious injury or death involving a motor vehicle. What department in your office would handle such cases? And how would you assess whether a crime has been committed or a crash involving fatalities, critical injuries, and serious injury as it termed in the uh, penal code? Also, um, um, regarding, um, would you, would you also establish, um, explain your criteria for uh, to examine the event data recorder compatible device located in the vehicle involved in a crash, crash and provide specific details, details and how you would handle it as a district attorney. Thank you. Okay, so that's a big question. I'm gonna break it down and first say that um, uh, tragedies involving cars uh, are a big problem in our city and one that um, uh, I've seen happen all too often in my neighborhood. And I think that the way, uh, the way to get to the root cause is to have less cars on our street, more safety measures for pedestrians and cyclists, um, and to spend more money investing in infrastructure that protects them. I see a lot of these streets have these very narrow bike lanes uh, there's not enough space. If you have an SUV going down some of these streets, um, you can criminalize people and you can incarcerate people, but that is the death trap. Um, and the same thing for not having enough red light cameras, right? These are ways to deter people and deter the behavior. Um, and so for me, a lot of what guides me and the response for accountability is the victims and their families and the community leaders. And I think for something like this, it's important to have a collaborative process where we assess things on a case by case basis for what the right solution is, the right response that always goes back to, are we making our streets safer for families to ride their bikes and cross the streets? Um, and for um, the event data recorders, that, that's the second, the last part of your question, right Dave? With, with it, yeah, within the, uh, the vehicle, there's data recorders, but what would you, 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 you talked about uh, things what other agencies could do. What would your agency do in terms of investigations and specific units to determine? That's what the crux of the question also is. Well, we would, we would make sure that we are investigating these to use all data and information available to understand how it happened, why it happened. Was there any recklessness, negligence, or deliberate and wanton behavior in using the vehicle for these kinds of tragedies. And I think that would dictate our next step. You know, Is this a, a, a crime that falls under negligence, recklessness, homicide, manslaughter? There's no shortage of tools in the district attorney's office nor any division that can address this. At, at, that goes the same for any other behavior. Um, that is not a scarcity in the district attorney's office. So we can have in a vehicular um, uh, unit, vehicular crimes unit that can be played in there. You can do it in the murder unit. You can also do it in a homicides unit. Um, it crosses over many lines because the bottom line is someone was injured and someone did something to make it happen. And that's uh, that early part of the assessment is what will dictate where it goes and, and what the response would be. Thanks David. So, uh... So honey, if you have time for one more question before our next- I have question. all the time in the world. This is my uh, time for seven. Thanks. So this is coming from Grace Price who tried to ask this question earlier and has put it in the chat for us. Uh, I'm just gonna read this out, out to you. Uh, the current Manhattan District Attorney's Office has embarked on a crusade to prosecute President Trump and all indications point to charges being filed when he leaves office in January. If you are elected and you discover evidence of a criminal wrongdoing in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, either by uh, District Attorney Vance or one of his employees, and it lies outside of immunity protections, will you prosecute or, I'm sorry, on past recs, assume that means passed along recommendations to federal prosecutors for prosecution? Okay. Can you synthesize that question for me? I'm just yeah, trying to- I, it, it. Let me tell you, it, it, as far are as- Are you I, saying would I it, prosecute Trump? It, it sounds like, in fact, would you prosecute those who are currently within the Manhattan District 
attorney's office if there was some sort of impropriety in their uh, behavior, including um, the current district attorney himself, outside of any immunities that may allow. I think one of the main reasons why we have a two-tiered system uh, of injustice is because we have a system that protects the powerful and privileged and one that criminalizes people of color to scapegoat those who are powerful and privileged uh, who engage in crimes and um, with impunity. Um, I think that it's important if we are, uh, if I do inherit this case, that we do prosecute Trump. And I think there's more than enough information out there to show um, that there is wrongdoing here. And so to give him a pass would be wrong and would send a message that um, we are not taking this job serious. I don't think that there uh, is under the law, you know, protections uh, or things that would allow for prosecution of Cy Vance. Um, but, you know, he's done this so many times. Uh, plenty of defense lawyers have given him donations for him to look the other way. Um, and it's because when you don't have somebody from the impacted community, when you don't have, when you have somebody that comes from an ivory tower that can be bought and can be pressured and bullied to look the other way when appropriate, then that's why these things happen. And it's imperative that we have somebody um, that not only comes from the impacted community, but has a track record of holding these kinds of powers and agencies accountable, turning around a culture uh, towards investing communities and bringing safety and stability to our society as a whole. Thank you, Tahani. And uh, just to eliminate that there were some specific examples, Grace cited factually um, in the chat. I didn't read those out in the interest of time, but if folks want to follow along with those, and Tahani, if you want to follow up on them, you're more than welcome. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate you being here to speak. And I'm going to throw it back to Jeremy. Speaking of in the interest of time, I think we are on time and with our last candidate. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, uh, Patrick's right, we're on to our last candidate of the afternoon, uh, Tali Farhadian Weinstein. Uh, Tali, are you on with us? I am, I'm right here, Jeremy. Hi, how are you? Uh, uh -huh. So uh, as with everybody else, you get four minutes for an intro and then we'll hop to questions. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Jeremy, um, and to all of the clubs who are hosting tonight. And I guess it's fair to say, good evening. It's pitch black outside my window uh, at this point. Uh, so um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited to introduce myself to you and to hear um, what's on your mind and to take your questions. So uh, I thought I would start by just telling you who I am and who I am in just one word. It's very easy for me to choose one word to describe myself, uh, and that is immigrant. Uh, I came to this country as a young girl with my mother and my brother to meet up, meet up with my father who had come here ahead of us to flee the violence and the anti-Semitism of revolutionary Iran. And we came here to seek asylum, uh, and ultimately, with the help of pro bono lawyers who worked with us for over a decade, we were able to make an asylum claim and ultimately to get amnesty when President Reagan did a massive amnesty um, at the end of the 1980s. And the reason I say that that's who I am is because that's how I see the world, even though my life is really different uh, than it was in those early years right after our arrival in the US. For me, it's how I see everything in a couple of ways. First of all, I never take for granted what my parents brought me to this country to experience, which is fairness and safety. And that's why I've made my career about trying to deliver on fairness and safety for others. It also means that when I see barriers to access or to opportunity, even if they're not barriers that I may have experienced myself uh, and could never experience because of my gender, because of my race, I still want to tear them down because I know what it's like to stand on the other side of a barrier of a border and to want to be let in and to be allowed to live free and to thrive. Uh, it also means that I identify with that I identify with that vulnerability that I experienced at the beginning of my journey as an American, and I have tried to make my career about looking out for the most vulnerable among us. Um, 
After those early years, I went on to work across American legal institutions from the Supreme Court to the front office of the Department of Justice in the Obama administration to federal prosecution. And I thought I would just spend a little bit of time telling you about my last stop, which was as the general counsel and part of the leadership team of the Brooklyn DA's office just across the river, because I think it really is uh, really the most important of my experiences in helping me form my vision of how I want to deliver on fairness and safety in Manhattan. And, you know, the reason I say that is because in Brooklyn, we were doing the work that has been the subject of so much conversation tonight, and indeed so much of the conversation around uh, what the Manhattan DA's office ought to be. Uh, I went to work for Eric Gonzalez because he had the ambition of making it the most progressive prosecutor's office in the country, while also maintaining our commitment to public safety. And I really do think that we started to build a national model over there. And, you know, people would call us all the time from offices around the country to say, how do you do this and how do you do that? And the vision of criminal justice reform that I learned there, that I teach to my students at NYU Law School, and that I want to bring to Manhattan can be summarized like this. I think we have to do less in some areas. We have to pull back from the cases that don't advance public safety and that actually harm people, that hurt communities. We have to bring fairness to parts of the system that have been unfair. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I've done that. And then I think we need to do more in really recommitting to the core mission of the office, which is around safety for the most vulnerable. So in Brooklyn, on, you know, on the side of correcting and restoring fairness and doing less, I want to highlight a couple of the areas in which I led. Uh, I built the first post-conviction justice bureau in the country. As part of that, I supervised the premier conviction review unit in the country, and we published a massive first-of-its-kind report about the causes of wrongful conviction, which I urge you to find. It's called 426 Years, and you can read it online. We instituted, under my leadership, new policies regarding parole, clemency, and excessive sentencing. I helped build and supervise the Law Enforcement Accountability Bureau, where we investigated and prosecuted police officers for all manner of offenses, and also managed an, an internal process for assessing and disclosing uh, credibility issues related to police officers. We were the first, as far as I know, in the state to create and to publish a list of cops that we found not credible and would not work with. We stretched to use our powers in different ways to deliver on public safety. So for example, I led the team that joined the Attorney General in suing ICE over their policy of arresting non-citizens in and around our courthouses, of using us as bait, because we found that that was grossly inhibiting non-citizen women who were the victims of domestic violence from coming forward because they were afraid that if they sought safety and protection, they or somebody they cared about, uh, maybe a witness or maybe the defendant himself could be picked up by ICE. And we won in federal court. Uh, the court agreed with us that this, pro this uh, policy that ICE had had to stop. And really in Brooklyn, I think that we were the leaders on developing diversion programs, on bringing fairness into the bail and pretrial detention system before there was any legislative change. And, you know, I think the balance of all of that, and this is the last thing I'll say, Jeremy, before I turn it back to you, is we have to do all of that work of reckoning, of restoration, of fairness, of pulling back. But, you know, I often find that the conversation around the country in criminal justice reform and here in this debate is all about what people are not going to do. And I want to leave you with what I do want to do, the cases that I do think are vital uh, to bring, to focus on, and that are really at the heart of what it means to be a good prosecutor. And for me, that starts with gun violence. Uh, I have uh, an elaborate plan um, on my website, drawn on my own experience, prosecuting gun trafficking, trafficking cases as a federal prosecutor, prosecuting murders, where I think that we have to come at this with full force, understanding that we now have twice, twice as many shootings uh, in the city as we did all of last year. Um, and it's serious and it's intolerable. I think I just saw as I was getting ready to come onto the Zoom that um, a gunman walked into um, St. John the Divine uh, and started shooting that, you know, in the last couple of hours. Um, 
you know, a beloved part, uh, a beloved institution here in New York City. Second, I think we have to. Colleen, build I'm sorry that. to interrupt, but do you mind yeah. if we if we get to questions? Uh, I've been yeah, trying to sure. just give everybody four minutes uh, no, for their. No worries. Oh, I was just. I'm going to say the words Bureau of Gender Based Violence, Jeremy. And if you like, yeah. someone can ask me about it. And if not, I'll just leave it at that. I think that sounds great. Thanks very much. Okay. My pleasure. Uh, Deborah Scott Gonzalez, uh, you've had your hand up. Do you have a question? Deborah, can you unmute? There you Hello. Go. Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. Um, I usually don't vote in any election but the presidential, I hate to say. I do go out and I, you know, kind of more or less just go through the process. But a lot of times I haven't really looked at any one candidate to see what they stand for. And a lot of times I find that a lot of people do that and we just pull the lever not knowing who and what you stand for. I also feel that I do that because of the fact that when election time rolls around, people say what you want us to hear. And a lot of times within the first hundred days, none of what you've said is done. It's like you get along to go along. And that bothers me as a person with a community that doesn't get the justice at times that they deserve. My daughter works at Rikers Island. And I know that a lot of low level crime is being, um, people are being held because of a low level crime. Deborah, I'm sorry, do you, have a, do you have a question for the candidate? I don't mean to cut yeah, you I'm, off. But... I'm getting to it. I thought I was asking the question. Okay. I, I wasn't asking a question. So my Please. question, anyway, never mind. No, 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 we'd like to hear your no, question, no, please. Mind. Never mind, because I was asking the question. God, could, did you, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can respond, Jeremy. Um, I, I'd like to say two things in response. Um, first, um, I understand your frustration, Deborah, and uh, I, I think that um, we do often see in politics people who make a lot of claims and have a lot of big ideas do a lot of virtue signaling and pandering and then don't um, put any of that into motion. And I would urge you um, to go to the polls, <laughs> no matter who you vote for, um, but preferably to vote for a candidate like me um, who can back up my claims with experience. Everything I say is rooted in experience and in leadership, as I said, across American legal institutions. So these are not just ideas. Um, this is all drawn from work I have actually done, including in a sister DA office uh, where we really tried um, to put a vision of criminal justice reform and I think succeeded into motion. Uh, the second thing I would say, you know, just to reflect on your daughter's experience at Rikers is that even before the bail reform legislation that has now been through two iterations um, was passed in Brooklyn under DA Gonzalez's leadership, we used supervisory processes to change the default rules for how ADAs uh, could go about asking for bail and thus achieve pretrial detention in misdemeanor cases. And we reduced our population that we sent to Rikers from Brooklyn voluntarily by 80% without any adverse impact on public safety. I think we were leader, the leaders in the state on this and I think actually created the conditions uh, in which bail reform could happen because people saw that this could be done. Thanks. Uh, Susan Burke in the chat wanted to uh, find out more about the program that you were mentioning at the end of your introduction. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, so this is, you know, I spoke about gun violence, but uh, equally important to me is gender-based violence, Susan. And by that, I mean domestic violence, sexual assault, cyber crime that is motivated by the victim's gender, hate crimes that are motivated by the victim's gender. And I think that, you know, this is the place where across the country and here in Manhattan, prosecutors have really not done their job. I think that uh, we know that we have a reporting problem, which means that people don't even want to come forward. Less than half of incidents of domestic violence and of sexual assault are even reported. And despite that, the NYPD received 250,000 domestic violence calls 
last year. Uh, and that was before um, we now know domestic violence has gotten so much worse and harder on people because folks have been locked in, right, um, stuck at home with their would-be abusers. Uh, when people do report, they next report widespread dissatisfaction uh, with how their cases are handled. And I think that we have to completely reorganize ourselves to train differently, to investigate differently, so that we are investigating the offender in the first instance and not the victim, to make sure that we are working in partnership with service providers throughout to meet at every need of the victim, not just the needs that law enforcement can meet, like protection and accountability. And then I think we have to have the moral courage and the commitment to bring the hardest cases, and particularly to take on what I think is a deep cultural misunderstanding about how this kind of violence works, because in the vast majority of cases, the assailant and the victim are known to each other. And that does not mean that there was consent to the act of violence. And I think in all of this, um, the next DA has to say, hold me accountable if I don't do better. And that's why I want to build out a new bureau that answers directly to me with a specialized core of investigators and prosecutors who are going to do this work every day. Great. Thank you. Uh, sure. Kathy Slowinski, are you there? Do you have a question? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Hi, Tally. I want I, uh, I wanted to ask you, you had a position at a different forum I was at where you endorsed solitary confinement. You said you were against doing away with solitary. Also, uh, you said you would accept real estate money. Can you address these two issues, please? Yes. Um, Kathy, if I may, I don't endorse solitary confinement. The question was whether I could agree that it should be banned in every single instance. And what I said at the Jim Owls Forum is the reason that's hard for me is not because I don't understand the gross abuse and misuse of solitary confinement, but because from my own experience as a federal prosecutor, there were limited instances in which we needed solitary confinement for the safety of the defendant himself. So, and the specific example that I was thinking about was, you know, I worked with a lot of cooperating witnesses. Uh, they were in great danger before they took the stand. And often the only place where a prison was able to keep them safe was inside solitary confinement. So it's limited. It is not an endorsement of the practice across the board. On the issue of, you know, funding and taking money from real estate, I'm actually glad you asked that question because I think that there is only one apparent conflict, really one in this race, and I'm the only candidate who, who has really tied my own hands against that, and that is taking money from the defense bar. So I'm the only candidate in the race that has said I will only take one dollar, not just from the criminal defense attorney herself, but from her partners, which means leaving a lot of money from law firms on the table. And the reason I've done that is because I think it has really undermined confidence in the office when people are represented, a defendant is represented by someone who's, let's say, even her partners have been you know, a big contributor to the district attorney, and it gives the impression of being able to buy access. Uh, it gives the impression of corruption, even if there is not any underlying corruption. Uh, and, and I just think the better practice and the one with integrity uh, is to say no to that and to keep the defense bar uh, at arm's length while also having them weigh in in other ways through their expertise. Um, otherwise, I don't think that there are any industries that I would describe as more likely to come into, you know, um, to be the target of an investigation or prosecution than any other. Um, and, uh, you know, th that's why I've really drawn the line where I think a person running for this office needs to draw it. All right, thank you. Thanks. Um, I do see one new name in our list, so I'm going to let Steve Vaccaro uh, cut the line and ask a question. Steve? Thanks very much. And, and Tali, um, you mentioned gun violence and gender-based violence as uh, two areas where you think there needs to be more done by a prosecutor. Um, and uh, I, I want you to ask, uh, answer the same question regarding traffic violence. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know whether or not you think sober, reckless driving, for example, is something that's deserving more prosecutorial attention, not necessarily more incarceration, but mm -hmm. more attention from law enforcement and specifically what you think of recent attempts to create low level unclassified misdemeanor liability for people who seriously injure and kill others with a motor vehicle while sober. 
um, and whether you would consider implementing a, a greater level of review at the DA level um, beyond just looking at cases that cops happen to bring mm -hmm. to the DA's office, which is basically yeah. how it works now. Yeah, um, I really appreciate the sensitivity with which you asked that question. Uh, and um, look, yeah, I, I think the question is rooted in a, a really, uh, really painful level of violence of this kind. You know, I think that um, last year, which is the last year in which we saw statistics, 30 people in Manhattan were killed um, through vehicular violence. Uh, we just in Brooklyn lost one of our dearest colleagues um, she was hit by a bus uh, while she was on her bike on Labor Day um, and died that night. And uh, I do think that this is an area that needs more attention. Um, I believe that you are referring to the Vehicular Violence Accountability Act, uh, which I do support. And, uh, you know, I think there's a second question there, Steve, that I think is also really important, which is, the office needs to have the capacity to investigate and proactively bring cases not just bring in, not just in this area, but across areas, you know, not just respond to what the police pick up, but to really work with the police and to work with investigators uh, to develop cases, uh, which of course is what we did as federal prosecutors. You know, it's just, it's a different muscle. Um, it has to be exercised. Uh, it's a skill that can be taught. Uh, and it is um, an area in which I really hope to lead, you know, across different areas of practice in the Manhattan DA's office. All right, thanks very much. Um, we are, uh, we're out of time. Um, and I see that there's still a couple of hands up. I apologize, uh, but I think you guys have uh, had a chance today to ask some questions. Tali, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Um, and uh, really thanks to everybody. Uh, I just, I also wanna call out uh, Marion Rydell and Tammy Meltzer who helped us man the chat and the waiting room today. Um, uh, I want to remind you that this was sponsored by all of the downtown Democratic clubs, including mine, Grand Street Dems, uh, Village Independent Dems, Downtown Independent Dems, CODA, UDO, and the Village Reform Democratic Club, and, uh, and Patrick's Club, New Downtown Democrats. Uh, one last thing, I know there are a couple of clubs that are having a meeting after this one. Those are all in different Zoom meetings. Uh, so if you're heading to one of those, you should close out this meeting and head over to that one. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to let Patrick have the last word. Patrick. Well, thank you, Jeremy. And, and just to echo uh, all of those sentiments, um, but especially, you know, thank you to all the clubs and to all of you, but especially thank you to the candidates. Um, I know, you know, we've taken a few hours of your time this afternoon, but um, I, I think we all recognize one thing and that it is an important office. Uh, it is most likely a, an open office. Uh, and so this is an incredibly important race. But as candidates, um, you've done something rather brave, which is to put your hand up and put yourselves out there. And not a lot of people are able and willing to do that. Um, so no matter how it winds up, uh, just know that, that I think a lot of people do really appreciate how much you've extended yourselves and how much you're willing to be public servants uh, in, in that matters. So thank you very much for that and thanks for being with us.